or in, intro music for people? Uh, I just want to check to see if this is all working. Oh yeah, and um, if you want, I recommend bringing up like the go to twitch.com slash wolg and then make sure to mute and pause the video and then uh, and then you can type in the chat too because people are going to be asking you questions in the chat and shit probably right okay so twitch uh, what was it it was twitch.tv slash wolg oops I fucking typed it wrong in here oh no, here we go Right. <laughs> We're intended for the mature audiences. Yeah. We're very mature, aren't we? Okay, stream starting soon. We're intended for the mature yeah. We're very mature. Aren't we? Uh, so m m make sure to mute the video. Uh, uh, how do I do that? Scroll down and mouse yeah. over, bottom left. Mute. Okay. And actually pause it, pause it, because otherwise you're going to be like using up bandwidth for nothing. Okay, cool. So now you see the chat. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, everyone. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna start. Oh, here we go. Hey. Okay, so uh, switch back to your face on on whereby. Right. For now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. Let me go. Like this. All right. Sweet. Uh, track review to Rob's album. Okay. And you see, uh, Okay. Cool. So, hello, everybody. Um, so, today it, we have... It's happening. Yeah, it's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, we have uh, Rob Clouth here. Um, hello. This is Rob. And... Uh, uh, yeah, and we're gonna, he's gonna tell us a little bit about his new album, and, um, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not super prepared for this, but I'm sure it'll work itself out. <laughs> so, cool, yeah, so, first of all, I guess, how, how are you doing, Rob? Tell, tell us about your um, situation. Um, my situation is pretty relaxed, actually, um, because, I'm in Barcelona and we've got this whole coronavirus lockdown at the moment. You, but uh, so I can't leave the house. But it's not sorry, really that much different from my sorry, normal life, to be honest. Cor coronavirus? What's what's that? <laughs> I don't know, like just this thing that people have been talking about. You can't <laughs> ignore it. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, it's been pretty chilled. Just been um, working on my AV show, actually. Nice. That's for when concerts exist again. Yeah. Which will be, be fun. <laughs> um, um, no, but I'm really in with my mu a music video for uh, Zero Point as well. Mm. Um, yeah. It's, and, and a new one? Well, you, yeah, I wanted to ask you. So I saw the video that you posted recently. I can't remember what yeah. track it was for. But Imagine from. Okay, so and it said it was a collab... Uh, with another person, I'm. I was curious about like what were what was your role in that and what was their role in that. So um, basically, you remember the shapes in the video, um, <laughs> because the idea of the video needed like loads and loads of shapes for it to be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, he basically designed some of the shapes. Um, uh, cool. Yeah. Um, originally, uh, he was going to have like a bigger role in the. In the music video, mm -hmm. um, but he went on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> and it, who, who is this guy? Uh, he's um, yeah, a friend of mine. He does oh, like okay. animation and motion design and things like that. He's nice. my housemate actually. Oh, nice. That's cool. Um, yeah. Do you find like it, like working with um, working with Mesh? Do you find like that they're often trying to like put like force you into collabs with people or is it sort of like you kind of get to you get quite a bit of dis like for example are they like are they like hey we're gonna get this guy to do a music video for you or is it sort of like no not at all no. oh that's cool i mean that's really cool mesh is just um max 
and uh, Anthony, which is the the label runner, mm -hmm. and it's the most chill people in the world, and oh, nice. they just give complete creative freedom, basically. Ah, that's sweet. Yeah, okay. Because cool. with like previous releases, especially the Traum one, mm -hmm. um, they actually, you know, I sent them the tracks, and I was like, here, here, here are the tracks. These are finished. And um, Riley, the label boss, was like, are they there? Are you sure? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> a little bit more like or something like that and i've never had that before i've never had like the label being like oh can you actually just change the music mm. it's not it's not appropriate um <laughs> Fuck it. yeah so like a lot of the techno -y stuff from that cloud complex releases was actually put in at that request from the label yeah i remember hearing some of those tracks on i remember hearing some of those tracks on soundcloud like before the adjustments and uh or i can't remember if you sent them to me or if i heard them on soundcloud but yeah the it's interesting how they changed but you really adapted really well to those those the, those suggestions i feel like it still yeah, really yeah, came out as your own you know um yeah i mean it was basically just turning up volumes of the kick and having like a djable intro like a <laughs> 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 so you can oh it says i i'm supposed to turn up your volume Okay. My... No, 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 no. It's me. It's on my side, I think. Tech, okay. can you talk for a sec? La, 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 la. Is that better, One, two, everyone? Eight, nine, eleven, fourteen. One. <laughs> 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 nice. Okay, cool. Um, all right, cool. So let's, let's talk about, like, so first of all, I don't think that there's anyone in this stream that doesn't know, but if you want to just quickly introduce like the, the idea behind the album. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's my first album. Uh, I mean, I've done a bunch of EPs before, but, um, and they're quite long, like sort of 30 minutes, but I didn't really count them to be albums because um, they were kind of more like compilations of tracks that I'd done recently. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas I wanted this album to like have like a solid concept, which like kind of directed all of the production and the, and the tracks and just, just directed the whole thing basically. Mm -hmm. um, and two years ago, or maybe more, I can't remember, um, I decided it was going to be about randomness and chaos and how that relates to order and stuff like that. Just cause I mean, you know, I love generative stuff. Um, like Orteco, one of my heroes, while they still are. Mm -hmm. And so I knew it had to kind of be about sort of randomness and chaos and and just noise. Uh, lots of like... <laughs> sort of sounds. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, when I was doing the research for like um, what different angles I could take on that, uh, I discovered this um, zero-point energy field which is um yeah so basically because of uh, the heisenberg uncertainty principle um which means that you can't you can never know like the exact position and, and momentum of like a particle at any one at any one time mm -hmm. uh, it means that there's this constant like kind of jittering in the energy level of a, of a system and because of this jittering uh you it can't have zero energy so that means that in in a space with no particles like no physical matter at all you still get energy oh interesting yeah and that's that's called the zero point energy um oh. and it basically manifests as this completely random like really low energy kind of hiss i guess like sort of electromagnetic hiss and it extends throughout the entire universe. It's everywhere. It's like the noise um, floor. Yeah, it's like the noise floor of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I find this lab um, in Australia. I wonder if I can find the link and share that. Um, yeah, uh, which basically samples from the zero point energy field in real time and uh, post online it's like an api that you can just uh stream into uh where, where shall i post this can you post it in the chat i just realized that wait you have a twitch account though yeah 
Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll verify your fucking identity. I know. I know it's brutal. <laughs> uh, okay, let me just do that quick. Done. Right. Okay. Yeah, I just sent it. Nice. Um, yeah, and what's interesting about this uh, this random feed is it's entirely random. It's um, it's like a true random source, which means if you look at like the distribution oh. of which numbers are going to come up, it's like a flat distribution. Oh, interesting. So, it would be a really good source for um, kind of doing, you know, randomizing stuff, just because it's like very very pure and it fits in with the, in the with the theme of the album uh -huh. um, but in terms of like aesthetics like it sounds just like white noise it's right. not it's, it's completely indistinguishable from from just using any like random number generator is that that but white noise that the... when you hear the noise it's like you know that it's uh it's sampled from uh -huh. the core of the Universe. Is that the rent is or sorry, is that like the white noise at the very beginning of the album? Yeah. Nice. Okay, cool. So most of the noise, apart from noise from distortions in the album, is is from the zero point field. Cool. Yeah. And then so uh and then so like how did you imp like in, in what ways did you use the, the like I'm sure there was a ton of them, but like in what ways did you use these random numbers in the album? Um, so, and then, and also I'm kind of curious about like, was it a live sampling of that noise or were you, you just like recorded a chunk of it and then you were like, okay, I'm going to use this as my input for certain things. So I wrote a, um, Max for live device to get the live data. Oh, cool. But then I went to do this, um, music retreat. Mm -hmm. Um, there was no internet there. I had to like walk up to like mm -hmm. this hill to get internet. So basically, I just downloaded, um, I can't remember how many megs, but just like loads and loads of the data. Nice. Um, and then just uh, used from that. But I've still got the um, like the live one digging around somewhere, which I thought I might use in like a live set or something like that. Something. Yeah, yeah. That would be cool. And well, yeah, I was, I'm curious about like what's in, uh, like when you, when you use Max, um, do you use the JavaScript thing quite a lot or like, like, are you use max objects a lot or do you use gen a lot? Like what's like, where do you find you spend most of your time in max? Um, so I use, um, like max objects until I need to do some like more logical thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I go into JavaScript just cause like sometimes connecting up boxes is not the right way to solve a problem. Right. It's like lots of like chained if commands or, or like yeah. and stuff like that. or like iteration is like awful in Max using Uzi, mm Uzi. -hmm. Um, yeah, no, I'll do, I'll do JavaScript for that sort of stuff. Um, nice. And do you use yeah. Gen ever or not really? Mm, I use Gen. Oh, I really like the um, Gen for shaders. Yeah. That's, That's so cool. cool, yeah. I know, I remember um, when I found that, I was like, oh my god, yes, finally! <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've used that a bunch, but uh, nice. Gen for actual audio, not really, hmm. to be honest. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I haven't really delved into it that much. Cool. Yeah, me neither. I, like, I started fucking around with it, and then, yeah, I found the Gen for shaders thing and played around a little bit with that, but then, um, yeah, just eventually kind of put it aside and did other stuff i spend most of my time like like i actually don't use the javascript thing very often at all i just use regular max objects for the mm. most part um yeah. okay cool so now um tell us a little bit can you explain this uh, so for you i think i remember you saying you were using mostly this concatenative synthesis am i saying that even right can you concatenative concatenative synthesis it's also called audio mosaicing which i think sounds cooler okay so you're using this audio mosaicing technique um can yeah. you tell us like first off what's the <clears throat> basic premise of this and and how does it work in general so the basic premise is 
it's something that you could do manually, obviously, but it would just take fucking ages. But basically, um, you've got a target sound that you want to replicate, and you've got a bunch of source material. Um, that source audio could be anything you want. Um, could be like, you know, samples, whole tracks, whatever. And then what this algorithm does is it chops um, the source material mm -hmm. up into uh, like little slivers of varying lengths. Okay, where are we talking uh, like like milliseconds or like or like five milliseconds, or hundred milliseconds, well, or like in that kind of grain size range, or or what? It can go up to ten seconds, and it can go oh, okay. down to like milliseconds basically because the algorithm is an optimization algorithm mm -hmm. so it decides the appropriate length okay so you don't say i want the grains to be this size right it, it decides um based on how closely um, it matches like the... How close it is to the, the 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 target okay so yeah um and basically the algorithm chops it up and then overlays the slices mm -hmm. um, offsets them in time so that it sounds like the target that's so interesting. Um, and it's super fun to play with because you can just like, I made a Max for Live device for it and you can just throw stuff in. That's crazy. Uh, Was that, um, so I saw something similar on the EarCam website. Is it is that where you kind of source, like started the the research from or? Yeah, so are you referring to Kata RT? Is it that? It might be, yeah. Yeah, so that's um, concatenative synthesis as well. It's the same technique, but okay. um, that's doing that's using a different algorithm. Mm. This one um, is using this technique called non-negative matrix factorization, okay. which is basically a way of um, like factorizing a matrix. So you've got like one matrix, and mm -hmm. then you want to split that up into two matrices, which when multiplied form that other one. Ah, uh, okay, okay. And so what this algorithm does is it it figures out. Um, uh, what's the best way of multiplying your source spectrogram mm -hmm. um, against a activation matrix, which selects the slices. Oh. Um, when you multiply those two together, it forms the final matrix, which is the target sound. And it optimizes splitting the target sound up into these two matrices. Oh. Um, That's... So, interesting yeah okay. it works it works really nicely yeah it's not perfect um but are you it's, anyway. are you keen to share like a little bit more about how someone might try this sort of thing or is that like maybe wait until you've gotten uh, all the fame yeah. from it and then you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i can i can show it for sure. you don't have um, to i no pressure i'm not, I'm I'm not. Sure. I'm sure. i think it's still working <clears throat> I haven't used it in months, you know, because this, this was from when I was doing the album. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, I guess before we dive into that, like, how long did the album take you? Like, when did you when did you start researching? When did you start writing? Um, and, and, like, how is that whole thing? How did that whole thing go? Thing? Um, probably, like, two years ago, I think. Um, I had the initial idea, maybe, maybe even a bit mm -hmm. longer, two and a half years. But um, it kind of went through in the sort of planning stage it went through a bunch of different iterations um because like the first iteration was just way too complex it, so it had these two ideas which um i still think are cool but it just meant that if i tried to do those i just would never have finished the album so the first one was um i wanted the it to be non-linear the album oh so yeah like from start to finish mm -hmm. um you would have this kind of like network of little chunks of audio. And then as it's playing back, it'll reach like a sort of a fork in the road. And then mm. based on some sort of probability, it would either go down this path or go down this path. And each of the transitions would be seamless. I like so, that, yeah. It would, you know, you could just sort of play it and maybe some of the, some of the connections loop back to somewhere in the beginning. Mm -hmm can be just this like continuous sort of stream of like flowing music um are you still thinking think about cool. doing that well it's just i'll do it for like a smaller project but, yeah like, yeah make a track or something like that but for an album it's it's really difficult because i wanted 
the album to sound really good obviously i mm-hmm. wanted it to sound like it had a really nice flow mm-hmm. um which meant concentrating my effort into a smaller amount of minutes mm-hmm. even though it ended up being 65 minutes um but if you wanted to have enough content so that all of the different parts that it could go through sounded good you would have to like make double double the amount of like content oh i would imagine a lot more than double yeah or like or maybe more like depending on how you set the network Mm -hmm. um it could be a lot more and i just didn't want to like spread myself too thin that's yeah fair Um, enough but it could be an interesting uh collaborative project yeah i remember you mentioning something about that in uh Mm -hmm. in uh florida when we were there um yeah Yeah, I think that would be a super, um, super interesting. I think, yeah, so yeah, I think that would be a super interesting idea to get like a big group of people generating like um, all these small little chunks. I think that's what you were yeah. suggesting, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I really like that idea. Um, okay, cool. So we'll circle back to that later, probably. Um, so for now, I was wondering if you wanted to maybe give a demo of like how how your max for live thing works and then maybe <clears throat> i mean it looks like there's quite a few people in the chat who would be who would really love to try this technique so if you could give us any pointers about and myself included if you give us any pointers about how we might do our own implementation or or where to even start with this kind of stuff so um the actual code is is quite um it's quite complex um i can probably share the the python code because because basically um, oh yeah the, you had the offline one right yeah so this is offline oh okay okay, okay. so it's not it's not real time you process some audio and then you mm-hmm. drag it back into ableton okay um, but it's all in ableton so you can drag samples into the actual device but it doesn't like do real time Okay. That's uh, something that I'm working on. Oh, cool. But, okay, um, sweet. <laughs> because the um, because the multiplication like the optimization is really intense, I needed to do that in Python because it's like um, right. to do it in NumPy, mm-hmm. which has got like, super super fast matrix multiplications and stuff like that. So like the core of it is actually in Python, mm-hmm. but then it's I, it's finally it's Python. Inside, it's <laughs> fucking hell. It's so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, there's an object for running Python inside Max. Oh, um, yeah, but that was it's super outdated. Okay, um, it wouldn't work with some of the libraries which I needed to use. Fuck. So I ended up um, calling it from the command line, calling it from the shell. But the shell is in Java. <laughs> Which is in Max. Is it... Wait, how do you get access to the shell in Java? Um, do you, yeah, you actually? I've done something. You run a process, basically. You you spawn a process, and then the, the process is Python running the code. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because I had um, I, there, I had an object a while ago that 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 you could s- just run terminal commands in, um, and I used that for generating li- uh, random data that was well random like numbers that were based on the whatever processes the computer was using and like how much ram and and cpu and stuff each process was using and then i would use that when i wanted to like randomize effects in a in a set (laughs) um it it wasn't that great but (laughs) but the the idea is fun I, i still have that somewhere i also have another one that's for like using the log file in on mac os to like generate uh, like using the log file to generate numbers to to mm-hmm. control different things so like yeah because that gets updated a lot more mm-hmm. um but yeah so uh yeah so i'd be super curious if you have some way of running terminal commands from um, yeah um oh do you want to have a look at this thing then yeah 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 let's see if i can get this working and then we're going to have to take a short little this? break because I have to take a piss. But yeah, I can see that. I'm going to make it full screen for the people at home. <clears throat> and uh, away you go. Can you hear this? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. 
Right. Um, and can you see my mouse? Yes. Great. So basically, this is the device. Mm -hmm. um, so the device, the right. wait, wait, the device, we can't see anything in the device. It just looks gray on the inside, though. I don't really know why. Oh, really? Yeah. Wait, are you sharing the Ableton window or are you sharing your screen? I'm sharing the Ableton window. Okay, so go back and share your screen. Um, right, okay. Okay, now? Um, yeah, yeah, now we can see it. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically this section on the right is where you choose your source material. You can also drag it in from like the browser or from like um, from the arrangement view or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, I used this a lot, which is basically hooked into a database that, um, do you know Kyle McDonald? Yeah, he's the... Like a, a new media artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. For one of his projects, um, which was really cool actually, um, he downloaded a database from Freesound of oh, nice. 200,000 sound, <laughs> um, shorter than five seconds, that uh, had... Um, like the right royalty mm -hmm. uh, setting. Um, and yeah, basically I wrote a little thing to tap into that so I can search for like, you know, like sand or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's all like sand signs. Ah, oh, nice. Like the quality of them isn't great because it's free signs, you know, but Brain. it's just super fun for like, <laughs> just finding loads of weird random <laughs> Yeah, that's brilliant. So then basically you choose your sounds. Um, and I would mostly just sort of click a bunch like this. Mm -hmm. like not really listening too much. That's kind of weird. Stick that in there. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so basically they get added to this panel on the side, which mm -hmm. is the sound that it's going to use for the source. Actually, let's take some out just because otherwise it's going to be hard to see what it's actually doing. Let's just leave it as breaking glass, bottle shatter, and that one. Yeah, so then basically you get a sample. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, let's just pick like. Uh, oh, yeah. Stick that in. Oh, I've already loaded it. Um, and then basically, so you've got a bunch of parameters here that you can set up. Your audio is getting really crackly, but it's kind of oh, amazing. It? It's it's fine. There's there's no way to fix it. I know. Don't worry can about I, it. Can um, I just bump this up, maybe? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Actually, yeah, that worked. There you go. Um, yeah. So then there's a bunch of settings that you can choose here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go for stereo taken from the source. One sits down, uh, and then you basically click process, mm -hmm. and it's going to process that, and then it bumps it into this mosaics folder, hmm. um, and it should be this one. Uh, no, it's not that one. You could open that window in the finder and then sort by date added or something. Oh, weird. Date added instead of date modified? I wonder if I've moved the actual folder. Let me just... Uh... Okay, one second. You figure that out. I'm going to go to the bathroom and okay. I'll be back in a second. Right. 
is that? <laughs> okay. I think I just crashed Ableton. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted yeah. to say maybe while you recover from your crash, yeah, uh, let's take a where we should take a moment to to answer some questions from the chat because I think um, um, people probably have some questions. Uh, so let's okay, yeah, ask your questions, everybody. Uh, Rob, are you uh, you're slowly recovering? Oh yeah, I can't hear you until Ableton boots back up. Fuck you, Wavecore. <laughs> okay, so... Um, okay, so May is asking, so basically it chops the sample and reorders the slices. Is that it? I'm not following, to be honest. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Do you want to just go over it one more time? Yeah. So, um... Basically, you've got a target sound, which in this case was this um, drum loop. Mm -hmm. you've got a bunch of source material, which is this breaking glass kind of sounds. And then what this algorithm does is it tries to chop up the broken glass in a way that when it's overlaid, it sounds like that drum loop. So if I drag in the result, you should be able to hear it. Do you hear nice. this? Yeah. That's great. Um, and, and so how does it decide if a sample is appropriate to be over, if a chunk is appropriate to be laid over that particular moment in time? Um, so basically, it's, it's using an optimization algorithm, which um, if you imagine like um, it's randomly, it basically randomly jitters around um, uh, these little chunks, like overlaying them in random permutations. Mm -hmm. And every time it does that, um, it compares that to the target sound. And then based on the difference, it... Um, it decides uh, where to move those next. Oh, cool. Okay. So it's like a controlled, um, like, random guessing. Um, it basically works in iterations. So if you, if you have a look in the device, uh, so you've got this iters, mm -hmm. which is 20. So that's how many times it's going to um, iterate over the source, um, like, uh -huh. doing these permutations and every iteration it gets better and better until um. like the final one it, it sounds pretty good but you can you can turn this down mm -hmm. uh, and it will run much faster but the result will sound less like the target sound hmm that's interesting it's basically it's, it's like granular synthesis um with variable uh grain lengths right and and a, a system of trying to um match the right grain uh, to the uh, target. Okay. Hmm. Cool. But it's, it's granular, and it ends up sounding quite granular. Um, oh, so okay. like I used it. I used it a lot in the album, and so... Because my thought with, like, the first one that you showed us just now, the out one, um, mm -hmm. was that it sounded quite smooth. Like, it didn't sound very... Um, it didn't sound very like, you know, those stretchy 
aspects of, of granular sounds that you generally get, but maybe it's, it's just because uh, the... Yeah, it's because the um, grain size it can be quite long. So if you imagine like it's um, it's trying to find a chunk of sound to replace like a <coughs> snare or something like that, mm -hmm. it will try and take the longest piece from the source material that it can. Uh, okay. And so if there's a piece in the source material which already sounds a lot like a snare, it will just drop the whole thing in whole. Okay. So the result of that is that it doesn't sound like that kind of granular sound where you've got really short kind of repeated sounds. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes they're quite long grains, okay. but they've been like synchronized with the um, with all of the other grains. Okay. But I think we should just just try another one with just like water kind of stuff, just so you can see. Someone's asking, how does it read the tar? Er, um, Sunk is asking, how does it read the target data, transients or something other than audio data? Um, it's a spectrogram. Okay. It's, a, it's almost like an image technique, basically, because it oh. first of all gets the spectrogram of the source material and the target <clears throat> material. And then, um, yeah. Oh, that's um, really interesting. Those are, the two, uh, those are the two matrices which it uses. Oh. So it's almost like it's looking for parts of like an image inside another image. Yeah, that makes me think about the face-to-face -face, uh, image GAN thing. Yeah, the thing is, it's this is a kind of style transfer. Yeah. Um, it's not, um, I think when someone figures out a way of doing it with machine learning, it's going to be much better than mm -hmm. this. Because um, this sounds quite um, pa like patchy sometimes, you know, right. it's quite, like, um, it's not super clean. Well, surely you would be a good candidate for figuring that out. Like, gener like basically, it sounds like what you need to do is just start building a database of the spectrograms of these so sounds, no? And then you could just load yeah. those, like, train st uh, style transfer GAN on that, and then away you go, no? Yeah, but the thing is, is um, you can't just, you, you can't treat it just as a pure image, because spectrograms have got different properties from normal images. Right. Like, for example, the um, um, like taking a square from um, like a spectrogram doesn't have the same meaning. Ah, uh, right. Um, if you move it up and down, mm -hmm. uh, so you can't just you can't just use the same techniques because otherwise it's going to sound shitty. Right. You have some sort of customized technique, I think. But um, hmm. there's some promising promising techniques uh, but they're just all super slow hmm interesting okay cool i that's let me keep that in the back of my mind as i work on my ai course <laughs> um okay cool so uh tqi is asking does google's magenta have anything similar to this oh that one turned out pretty cool so this is this is the water one um so Google Magenta, uh, they don't have anything um, like this technique, but they do have some really, really cool stuff on there um, for like generating, um, like doing morphing between sounds. Um, and there's another one where they can generate um, whole blocks of melody at once. And that was using an image technique, which I huh. thought was quite clever. And it's interesting. Um, yeah, but they don't have this specific technique. This technique I got from a paper um, called Let It Be. <laughs> Let It Be. So basically, I just... Can you post, can you post that in the chat? Nice. Nice. Oh, you should pause the the video for the on twitch okay it'll just make it better or easier for your yeah internet to work or something <laughs> <laughs> okay cool okay that's really hmm. 
Very interesting. Could you could you put in like a, a a vocal sample or something like that? I'm curious to hear how it recreates, yeah. um, like a voice or a melody type thing. Like my own. Sure. Yeah. La la la. Whoa! Whoa! One, two, three, four, five, six. La 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 la. <laughs> Baba. <laughs> I was kind of hoping that my voice would be get in there too, but I think it's too quiet. So we drag that in there. Do some processing. <clears throat> yeah, it'd be super nice if this was real time. Yeah, it'd be fucking cool. So it is really fun, like this, just playing around with it and stuff. But if you could actually hear it in real time, it'd be fucking. No super doubt. Fun. Yeah. The um, um. Oh yeah, let's hear this. Woo. Huh. Oh my fucking god, that's so tight. <laughs> um, can you can you drop us a, a, a little snippet of a tune in there? I'm curious to hear that with the, how that was done. Like a full track. Like a full track? Uh, not, not, no, 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 not, not the full track. I just mean like like two bars, but of a full production. Like like grab one of your, can you grab like the like a middle section of list of lists or something and put it in there? <laughs> uh, um, entire, where did I find um, Probably in here. Oh yeah. Why did I never finish this track? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. There's a couple of tracks that were on your SoundCloud a long time ago that I was like, fucking come on. <laughs> Let's try this one. <clears throat> so I'm gonna have to cut it down because mm -hmm. Uh, fuck, I just crashed Ableton again. I updated to um, Catalina mm -hmm. and it's been causing all sorts of fucking crit problems. Ah, I'm sorry to hear that. I think if you want to take a fucking crazy long time, you put a big ass in, like, okay, my bad, sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> just, do you still have the cunt presser? Someone in the chat is asking about if you could show that off. The cunt presser? Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, I don't even know where that would be. And have you considered a more, um, a more politically correct name for it? <laughs> <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, 90% of the joy of that effect was the name, to be honest. Because <laughs> you can do the same thing with a bunch of compressors just lined up. Right, right. Yeah, um, um, Lil Snake was showing me this technique of, that he uses of using a bunch of uh, instances of OTT, but like with the amount set relatively low, but he has like 50 iter iterations of them. <laughs> it makes some really crazy sounds. So this is um, that part. So basically, the part was this. And then the result sound is like this. Wait, what? You're playing, I think you're playing two things at the same time. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Um, yeah, you're playing a bunch of shit at the same time. No, I, I did it the wrong way round. I reconstructed that track with water instead of doing my voice with the... Um, oh, that's what you're... Okay, that's cool. Yeah. 
I didn't. I actually meant to do it this way around. I get rid of all the water shit. I just put that in and then put my voice back in here. Oh. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, but yeah, I used this throughout the whole album, actually. That's um, so sick. Maybe one thing that I could do as well is just show the parts where I used it. Yeah, I'd love that, yeah. Um, so, so, point, final audio. So the first track that I actually started from the album was Casimir. And the part which uses my voice, actually. So basically what I was doing was um, beatboxing and then reconstructing it with a bunch of samples. Oh, no way. Um, oh, that's so why everything sounds the, so like natural and shit. That, yeah, like a lot of the percussion, it kind of went, maybe went through processing afterwards, but it started right. like that. So like the, the part which comes in, this beat here is is my voice. Yeah, so that was me basically going into a mic like. <laughs> I was just about to ask you to like recreate the beatboxing play. <laughs> I've got all of the original recordings and they're so fucking lame. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's like one of these things which like the results sound super cool, but. Um, I just dread someone walking into the room when I'm doing it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I bet. Amazing. Yeah, um, I had my housemates to basically leave the house before I'd work on this. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Crazy. That's fucking sweet. Somebody asked him, how does it have so much bass? Do you want to touch on that? Or do you want to leave that as a mystery? How does what, what have so much bass? How does the output of the thing in the... the Casimir, that section of Casimir, how does it have so much bass? Oh, um, well, I overlaid it with um, fucking oh yo, I drum bass. Oh right. Um, Wait, I just had an idea. Yeah, this boom, the boom thing. Like boom is great for this kind of stuff because uh, you can basically just make any sort of sound, and then you just crack up the boom tune it to the right frequency and you've got like a kick drum type thing oh, hold on i just had an idea i was when i want to ask you if you can take i'm going to send you a couple of bass sounds that glork glunk one of the guys from the server made and i was wondering if you could like sing into it sing a bass line into it and we could hear it reconstructed with, with All right, some yeah, crazy yeah. reeses <laughs> and over. okay one sec let me just uh, where, are you, where are you sending it to uh, i'll send it to your email okay one sec. I just don't want to share your email address publicly in case that's not your kind of vibe. Um, um, have you heard the new Seppa? No. Who dat? I can bang in. Do you want to play it while we do this? Um, yeah, I haven't. Glork, are you okay with me sending Rob some of your bases? Sent it. No, I'm still I'm fighting with Windows. Stand by. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so it's uploading now. Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's for some reason yeah. I didn't. I sorry, I'm responding to somebody in the chat. They said okay. uh, they're uh, in arms that I didn't know who Seppa was, but I. It's true, I do know who Seppa is. We played with Seppa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. It's uh, I didn't realize it until I saw the name in text. Okay, cool. So I sent you some Glork samples. Okay. So. Um, balls in your court. <clears throat> so, oh, ooh, oh, there's loads here. Yeah, I just sent you a random bunch of them. Look what we got here. Um. Okay, I'm just done with this one. Can you can you grab a bunch of them and throw them in at the same time? I'm am really curious what it would sound like to like put them all together. I was trying to actually I was fucking around with something yesterday, of like using a generative approach to like randomly patch a bunch of those bases together to see what it would sound like. Glork says hit him up if you ever want more samples. Oh, which Cheers. I highly Cheers. recommend because I. Yeah, I, I use his samples all the time now because they're fucking amazing. And he makes really killer wavetables too, actually. Um, actually, uh, he made this. Yo, he made this. He made this work. like um, pack of wavetables, and shared it with like a couple dubstep people. And then very soon after, like all the dubstep people had his wavetables, and they were like being used on every new track. <laughs> they're so good, man. They're fucking incredible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I can't download this stuff. I don't know why. Oh fuck! What is it? What is it telling is it you? Chasing. Um. Oh. Oh yeah. Here we go. Oh yeah. It's just very slow to get started. Mm. Right. So what we got? I just grabbed a bunch of random ones. Hopefully, there's some good ones in there. Um, Actually, I'm sure there's at least one really cool one in there. So I'm just downloading them. Nice. <laughs> Okay, and then um, what? My voice. Yeah, just do like a just cool. Do like a. <laughs> I should do it, right? Oh yeah. no, I wasn't recording. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Oh, 
This is amazing. <laughs> ah, I'm satisfied. That was ah, life goals. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> Amazing. There's some great feedback in the track in the chat about that. Um, <laughs> someone wrote, "I love these Rob Klaus growls." Throwing pearls, <laughs> <laughs> throwing pearls in the garbage here. Is this <laughs> the stream content, or this is the stream content I came for? Just drum bust <laughs> that, and you've got a bass track. <laughs> and then so, McSoup wrote, "Leave my son alone." <laughs> 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 and then someone else wrote, "So this is how you make neuro." <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's. Uh, I'm going to put the share screen back on one second. Nice. Okay. Just one sec, let me full screen. That's gnarly. Hmm. It feels like it couldn't, because it can't, it can't pitch it can't adjust the pitch of the samples, can it? Yeah, so this is the thing. Uh, it works much better with a uh, small source material that's got a wide range of frequencies in. Right, right, right. So, um, so you'd have to do yeah, like so, a bunch of iterations of those bass sounds with like a bunch of different pitches, I, I imagine. Yeah, um, or another thing that you can do is just, um, yeah, just like go a bit wild with the pitch. Right. Just so it can capture like the higher frequencies. Uh, right. This is the thing because it's like it can only work with what it's got in the source material. Right, right, right. It will try its best, um, but if those frequencies aren't in there, then it just can't replicate them. Mm. Um, hmm. So I I messed around with um, like automatically in the algorithm pitch shifting it mm -hmm. and adding it back to the source material, mm -hmm. um, and. Yeah, that, that added like a kind of more richness to the sound. Nice. Um, but I haven't actually put a control in the Max Blood device. So. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But, um, I can put some like symbols or something in. Nice, okay. To spice it up. We just put another little snippet of like a second sign and maybe that'll... Like a si another sine wave? Yeah. No, sorry, like a second sun that um, your your track there. Oh yeah, um, I feel like that might dominate it there. Ah, true. Okay. Let's wait for <sighs> fine, uh, fine, uh, fine. Just crack that in there. Nice. It's like. So yeah, here you can change the FFT size, and this is the minimum, gr the minimum grain size that it can reproduce. So if you go for uh. higher, it replic replicates the frequency content better mm -hmm. and pitch more accurately, but it loses the the onsets. Right. And go smaller, and for like percussive stuff, generally I go smaller just so that the the onsets are like sharper. Right. Um, what about and have you? Is it is it would it be possible to do multiple window sizes or is that something that's like still a long ways away? Um, well, the yeah, I'm not sure about that to be honest. Hmm. Um, you could like uh, analyze the whole thing twice with like two different window sizes and then somehow merge the results. Hmm. Um, but the results um, are still good, like in terms of the frequency content with shorter, um, like window sizes. But this is like a limitation of just FFT in general. I understand. You just can't. Um, you can either have like accurate pit or accurate time. It's quite hard to get, get the two. I know. Okay. 
<laughs> Are you crying? <laughs> I know. It's just a limitation of FFT. <laughs> it's just the math system. <laughs> um, all right. All hey, right, cool. That was sick. Now OTT that. <laughs> <laughs> and I put a hundred compressors on it. <laughs> I mean, everything always sounds better with drum dust on, have you noticed? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Actually, I can't remember what I was doing, but there was this thing where I was like, fuck, I can't get this vocal to sound how I want it. And so I just put drum buzz on it and I was like, oh, it's basically that works. Like, good <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sounds good. <laughs> It's um, perfect. Yeah. That's amazing. That is the sound. Um, Gotta get some pitch variation in there. Yeah. So that's basically the reconstructor. That's uh, fucking amazing. Yeah. Okay, so good. That's exciting. Okay. Um, um, and then the, the Python implementation, can you show us where we can get that? Um, or is it something that you wrote? Well, it's something I wrote. Fuck, um, God fucking damn it. <laughs> um, yeah, because they didn't publish the code with the paper. Uh, so I had to like fuckers. figure it out just from the fucking equations and stuff. And, it was pain in the ass. Yeah, and I, I, spoke, I contacted them asking if they could share the code. And uh, they said that because it was for a commercial project, they couldn't couldn't share it. Mm. Um, but he did help me out with the maths, though. Which oh, that's nice. nice. Um, um, the music tools reconstruct uh, this. So I can barely remember how this works because I did this like a year and a half ago. Um, so basically, oh fuck, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go through this right now. Um, that's fine. It's um, so basically it calculates the spectrogram. Mm -hmm. uh, it loads it here, normalizes it, stitches all of the source audio files together into like one big file. Okay. Um, and then FFTs it. Uh -huh. So here's where it calculates the spectrogram. Uh -huh. um, and then it's got this match spectra um, kind of ability, which I, I haven't really used that much. But it tries to alter the frequency content of the source material so that it sounds more like the target. Oh, that's interesting. But it actually made it less interesting because it sounded too much like the target. Oh. Um, like, you know, because basically I feel like with these kind of algorithms, there's a balance between how much do you want it to sound like the source and how much do you want it to sound like the target. Right. And if it sounds exactly like the source, it's boring. And if it sounds exactly like the target, it's boring. Right, and you're trying to find this like point in the middle where it like captures like the like the dynamics of the target and like the, the sort of general kind of vibe, but keeps the texture from the source material. Mm -hmm. and so like this match spectra thing just kind of it put it too much in favor of the target, and it sounded a bit mm -hmm. a bit dull. Um, yeah, so it's got some more things shit. So yeah. Here's where it does the actual mosaicing. Um, so basically, it calls this. Um, yeah, so here's the iterations. So basically, 
it loops through this. Mm -hmm. um, this is the actual non-negative matrix factorization calculation. Mm -hmm. So this is where it tries to um, uh, multiply these two matrices together and then compare that to the target. And then based on the difference, it updates those two matrices. What, what two matrices is it, is it multiplying together? Um, so it's multi multiplying the spectrogram of the source material mm -hmm. all, all stitched together into one long spectrogram and a um, activation matrix. Okay. And the activation matrix starts out as just noise. Right. So if you listen to just the first iteration, it just sounds like gran kind of granular mess because it's... Um, because the activation matrix is, is random and it's activating random slices, like random frames in the source material. So it is sort of like, a, like it's like a logistic regression type yeah, thing, yeah. right? Like uh, the same sort of linear algebra, or what's a linear algebra type yeah, yeah. thing? Okay. It's, um, it's a, like an optimization. This isn't, it's not, um, is it doing gradient descent? I'm not sure actually. Because I didn't, I didn't really fully understand the algorithm. Well, if you have like, so if you have, so for example, so it takes, it has this weight matrix and it multiplies uh, the weight matrix by your, your, uh, your source material, right? And then there's yeah. a certain amount of loss. Like you, you, from that, you're calculating a loss function, like how far away it is. And then, by, yeah. and then you're updating that law and then you're like changing the weights and stuff. And then up, and then that gives you updated loss and you're finding the minimum loss. So it sounds like it is a, a neural net. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly if it uses some kind of gradient descent thing. I don't know how it figures out how to adjust the weights the next, the next round uh -huh. the next, based on the, the like errors in the previous one. Mm -hmm. Because basically this, I didn't ever fully understand the algorithm. All I did was was implement a series of written written instructions, like pseudocode. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Um, into maths, um, so I had to I had to understand the flow of the maths, but I didn't. Right. Don't really know. I didn't really understand wh which part was doing what. You know. That's interesting. Um, it's kind of crazy that like. I, yeah, that's one thing that I've always kind of been jealous of you of, of that, that you went, well, not jealous, but like, I wish that I had done the same thing of like, that you did a lot of, like you did, you did your bachelor's in physics, right? So you have this strong math backbone to, yeah, to, to bounce off of for this stuff. That's, I think that's super awesome. And it's like, this is a really sick way to use that. I'm glad you didn't go down the physics path and you went and did this instead. <laughs> it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, nah, it's, uh, yeah, it definitely has come in, come in handy. Not very often though, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, for sure. I'm sure it's not like super handy all the time, but like it's for, for like stuff like this, it's like, oh yeah, you already have an understanding of the math and like what yeah. it's supposed to do. And then, so like implementing in the code. But actually I wouldn't have done this if code had already been out there. Yeah. No it. fucking doubt. For sure. <laughs> It's not like I enjoy doing this. It's no, just no, for sure, yeah. The results that they showed in that paper were just so interesting that I just needed it for myself. Mm -hmm. And so I just spent days just trying to, like, figure it out to do it, to it myself. But actually, I saw that um, some months ago, uh, mm -hmm. they've released, uh, not these same people, but another people have released this algorithm um, as, like, a Python pit package which makes it much easier f to use. Oh, interesting. Um, I can, maybe I can find that and send it to you or something like that. Um, but yeah, this would be super cool to do real time. Um, and the way I'm thinking about doing it is uh, instead of, um, yeah, basically just doing it in chunks. So instead of processing the whole target, mm -hmm. you're processing an incoming block of audio. Right. And then it's just going like process, 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 process. So it's, it's just like the same algorithm essentially. Um, but the thing is, is it's never going to be super low latency because it works yeah, you well. You have to do a bunch of. 
comparisons and shit. Isn't that the time taking part? Not the efficiency of the algorithm. It's it's the fact that it works. This algorithm works well because it knows the future. Ah. Uh, so it can decide that like this one piece of audio is going to sound better like in the future because it's got I don't know like the sound has got the right little dip in frequency for it to go there. Whereas oh. if you're doing it in real time, you've only got that little window, right, right, um, to actually play with, mm -hmm. and so the the options that it has to like do a better optimization are much lower. Right, that's fucking uh, super interesting, though. Yeah, like the way forward with this stuff um, is machine learning for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, like some of the, um, it's like some of the algorithms which are coming out now that as, as soon as they can get them to be real time, it's going to fucking change forever. Yeah, no when fucking it's like sing into a microphone and, and like this algorithm captures your intent. Yeah. And you don't have any actual ability, like singing ability. <laughs> Like you want like, oh, I want this to sound like um, uh, cats, and yeah. you just go like, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and it comes like with like the same like vibe of what you're doing, but just sounding like perfect cats. Yeah. Or, like when you can be like, bah, 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 and it will just be, like this perfect saxophone. That's a that's gonna um, be unreal for um it's fucking bonkers for all the fucking like people who do, you know those like those like YouTube celebrities that have like all those funny sound effects and shit it's gonna be like a game changer for all of them <laughs> yeah and beatboxes as well yeah yeah but for sure you can just throw in whole drum samples you know mm -hmm. and just it comes out sounding like a perfect like amen loop but you're just like generating with your voice yeah that'd be <laughs> fucking cool. unreal um so werehogify was asking um uh how you got into programming or what got you into programming um so i was i tried to learn when i was maybe 16. um i can't remember why i wanted to but i wanted to learn c plus plus and um i tried to figure it out and i just couldn't um like my dad was helping me and stuff like that and um i was just i just couldn't figure it out uh, so I kind of like tried a bit too early to get into it and then kind of lost hope. But then I started using this um, game maker program called Game Maker. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had a friend who was super into that. Um, yeah, because I, I really like making like shitty little games. I, like before that, I used this thing called point and click. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that familiar to you? No, I'm not. It's like no. a way of um, programming games with, with just dragging in kind of like little objects and stuff like that. You didn't need to do any programming. But Game Maker was like an extension of that. And it had a scripting language. Oh. And I started doing um, little visual kind of experiments in that mm -hmm. uh, using the scripting language. And then it basically, I jumped from Game Maker to processing. Mm -hmm. um, and then processing to Java when I did a Java course in, in, um, in uni. Mm -hmm. And then from Java to uh, C++, and then just kind of outwards from there. So you finally made it back to C++? Yeah, finally. <laughs> 15 years later. Finally conquered it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I think I was just too young. Um, I remember I just couldn't understand what a class was. I remember like just like, that it yeah. didn't make sense in my head. That yeah, that also was a hard um, hurdle for me to get over. Like it seems so intuitive now, mm -hmm. but at the time it was just like, you know, I just, just couldn't get my head around it. Actually, to be honest, now that I think about it, it's been a while since I've thought about that, and I don't know if I still remember how what, how a, what a class is and how it works. <laughs> but I don't nowadays. Like, I mean. Yeah, I don't, I really do very little programming. And even that AI stuff that I'm learning about is like very, very little programming. It's like just more about the data science. How's that project going? Super good. Um, we were supposed to have a week of shows this week, but obviously because of uh, um, oh, fuck. all that Could stuff, they're canceled. But I'm actually kind of happy because I wanted to make a bunch more advancements in the AI side. 
it's working mm -hmm. reasonably well now. Um, it can make like some pretty cool chord progressions, but um, now going through the data science or the ma machine learning class, I like. Um, I feel like I understand a lot. I'll, like I'm not done the course yet, but I already understand like what my misconceptions were and like how I can really make it make it work and like what other aspects I need to add to my database to make it train super well. And I think mm -hmm. like just because of the simplified way I'm I'm thinking about writing the chord progressions, it uh, I th I think it's gonna work like way fucking better now. To be honest, cool. Um, it's funny because like, so, and then, so then obviously the next steps, like I remember we talked a little bit about like how to implement the rhythms and stuff. And I haven't thought much about that yet. Um, but that's going to be interesting. And then, and, and my goal with it also is like, is like for sure I want to make the AI for the cellos thing, but I also want to make the AI just to work for chord progressions and music in general. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that'd be super handy. Yeah, it'd be super nice to just have like, especially for like, <laughs> especially for like, you know, you get a contract to make like some, I mean, this doesn't happen a lot to me anymore, but like, uh, say for example, <clears throat> a client wants like a part of this, the music to get like really classical sounding or to get really like sound like X, Y, Z. It would be really nice to, instead of having to fucking hack through that on my own, I could just be like, okay, generate something that's in this, in this style or something. What's that? Double click on classical. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, but I think like it's, it's still a ways away from that. Like now my main focus is really just to make it so that it generates stuff in my style, not so much that it can do generate stuff in any style. Like my main priority is for it to make stuff that sounds like me and sounds like shit that I like. So um, check out some of the magenta stuff. Yeah, I did, and I fucking I, I I'm gonna check on it again because it was it's been a bit about a year since I checked on it last, but I I fucking really don't I I really didn't like it. I was like, ugh, this fucking sucks. <laughs> but, There's one for generating um, MIDI, which is quite cool. Is it good? I it's the, not locked to grid. Um, mm. I I was messing around with it a little bit because I wanted um, I bought like a, a foot pedal for my MIDI piano, mm -hmm. and I wanted to like hook up a bunch of different MIDI effects mm -hmm. so that like as I'm playing the piano, like I can just sort of loop stuff and put effects on and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them I I wanted to be just like um, like a machine learning continue what I've just played sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be that I would like play something. And then I'd pu push like the pedal down, and it would. I could just lift my hands off, and it would keep playing in that style. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And then I could like you know continue on from that and lift the mm. pedal off. I couldn't quite get it to work though. Um, That's I think like this the stuff that I'm working on like that that should eventually work, especially with like so w one of the things that I'm trying to work out now is like once I have a chord progression how to write a melody that goes over top of it. And mm -hmm. one of the ways that I'm using to write, to figure that out is like, so one of the key things in like making these things is like, vec like you can vectorize your, your imp like your input data. Yeah. So I, <clears throat> the way I want to make it is like, it can play every, any note on top of your melody, but depending on like, so for example, the root note of your chord would be like, like the least far away from from zero or whatever and then like the other notes in your chord are like just a little bit further away and then notes in a chord that is uh has the same function would be similar so like if you're in a subdominant chord it would pick also sub other subdominant chords yeah. in that key uh and then and then further away like tonic chords and then non-diatonic chords so that it is so that it understands like what notes would be kind of more appropriate in that in that thing uh and that's like, cool um, there's a uh, one technique which i've seen in, in like a bunch of these algorithms is um you have this thing called temperature have you seen mm -hmm. this yeah 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 so yeah like that's that like temperature would be so super cool in that because it's like how you define like the weirdness of your melodies mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. if you have, like the temperature what like super low would it be yeah yeah so then like, it would 
basically it's just copying like the the, the training data mm -hmm. and you can kind of like up the temperature and it sort of flattens the distribution so like all of the options have got the same mm -hmm. problem happening and then that's when you end up with something random you could track also like the, the it gets interesting too if you think about like how the for example if you if it's training on a melody then it might look at like how the temperature changes over time and how the temperature changes like the difference in temperature from note to note might also be an interesting feature like to train it on so then I, I don't know if you would call it temperature in this case but then so it would know like when it's appropriate for it to get really weird and when it's appropriate for it to normal back down to like more normal sounding notes mm. That there's like I, I'm thinking about that stuff a lot too with the chord progressions because it's like sometimes like there's times in a chord progression where it makes more sense to to play a non diatonic chord or like to play a chord from a, like a borrowed chord from another mode or something like that, um, mm -hmm. and so training the algorithm to understand when it's appropriate to do those types of things is also part of the like like making the database useful. How do you um? How do you write melodies like before the you know messing around with this algorithm and stuff? Have you got? Do you like play stuff in or do you like? No, it in? fuck no. Like, yeah, here I'll show you on my screen. Generally, what I do. Uh, share. Um, so honestly, a lot of the time, what I'll do is like say I have. Why well, I, I don't know why I'm sharing my screen actually. Say I <laughs> say I had a chord progression. Then, like, or say I just had a sample. Let's go. Mm -hmm. uh, pack three. Yeah, so say I just had, like, some shit going on underneath. Oh, wait. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this. Can you hear that? No. Hmm. Um, how are we going to do that? I don't think I can route that to you without whereby crashing. Let's try. You got so many inputs. Yeah. Okay. Let me just check if this is still working. Okay. Yeah, it should be working now. Okay, so do you hear this? Yeah. Okay, so say we have the, let's just put it a little bit lower. Um, oh, that was a nice little thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then say I have like something over top of that. Um, okay, so honestly, generally what I do is just like, like, Click randomly. Nope, doesn't work. And then, so <laughs> delete that and then, no. Okay. <laughs> you know, and then you can kind of like, once you get a couple notes in, you can sort of hear where it's gonna go in your head and yeah. then just try to put that down. So that's one way I'll do it. Another way I'll, uh, another thing that I used to use a lot more or I use this when I have to go really, f like when I want to do something really fast, is I'll just drag in a minor thing. Usually I'll do this if I don't have something else underneath it. But I'll drag in like um, this scale plugin, and then I'll mm -hmm. fucking just click randomly. Just thinking mm -hmm. about roughly like, do I want the melody to go up or down? Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you have a MIDI keyboard or anything like that? No. I don't, I don't use any of that. So I, I have like, like usually what I find with using any sort of MIDI instruments for writing music is that it, I can make something that sounds kind of cool in there. And then when I try to make it work in Ableton, then like I'll record it and then I'll try to adjust it so that it works. And then it just sounds like shit. So I don't know how to like, I actually don't know how to transition between the two. And I, and I much prefer just writing stuff with my mouse, to be honest. It's just the way I've always done it, so it's the way I feel the most comfortable and the way I can do it the fastest. Yeah, I, I always used to do it like that until this this album, because um, I bought a like a full size weighted um, mm. 
connected keys MIDI keyboard. And and then before I even started doing any of the production, I spent probably, I don't know, a couple of months just uh, composing stuff, mm. which was basically just like super late at night, really baked, just like, nice. just like good stuff. And, just, uh, and then I just dumped maybe like 50 melodies into a uh, like a big ableton project mm -hmm. um yeah so like all of the stuff was actually just from like these fuck like fucking rounds um with my hands but then uh i kind of like augmented it you know obviously like corrected it and sometimes just put whole like melodies and stuff in with the mouse on top nice. but, um, do you so I, like i get quite a lot out of that out of like sitting down and trying to write melodies on or just trying to write music on guitar or on on a keyboard, but I find that um, it tends to work better if um, if I just record it or if I yeah I I don't use them very often, but I use that as a way of like decompressing when I want to chill out and not make music on the computer, or as a way of like just playing through some ideas and try, like messing around with some techniques and stuff. So for mm. example, like I'll learn something from a YouTube video about, I don't know, whatever borrowed chords or some shit like that. And then I'll try to figure out how to do it on the, on the guitar usually. And then, or on a piano if I have access to one and then, and then I'll go to the computer and be like, Oh, okay. So this is what I learned from there. Let's now let's try and implement it into a song. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously the right way to do it, and your way is the wrong way. So, <laughs> um, can you uh, yeah. do you want to show a little bit of like how you go about writing melodies, or like what I I I've always actually been sort of curious about like how do you go? I guess on this album it was super different, but in general, like what's your process for writing like uh, beats and, and stuff like that? Um, or do you have a process, or is it pretty different every time? I don't know. It's basically I started from scratch with this album, and I've kind of forgotten my old way because um, mm -hmm. I, I was obviously in Fruity Loops before this, and mm -hmm. so I learned Ableton, um, and so I had to throw away like all of my devices that I, you know, BSTs and stuff that I relied on heavily, mm -hmm. and I basically just started from scratch. So I don't know. It's like it's kind of different for each each track. Um, mostly it started with, um, yeah, this like composition fade. This is what I did for this album. Um, um, and then when it actually came to production time, I had like a bunch of just preset melody, which I knew sounded good. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, yeah. And then I'd like either start a track with some other sound or some rhythm um, or I would start a track with one of those melodies um, yeah but I think some of the only tracks in the album which I kind of played then and there as I, as I was actually producing the track was the in the opening track a Diraxi Birth mm -hmm. there's the um, melody which like it's just a like short chord sequence which comes in at the end um, and that was played in live. Um, hmm. And then there's another one in The Nothingness Of. That was a li like a live jam. Hmm. Um, but the rest of it was, yeah, like pre-composed. Um, and then um, given to this pianist to record. Hmm. Right, I forgot. So, And then did you generate like... Um... <clears throat> Did you write the sheet music or did you use some Python library to convert yeah, MIDI to sheet music or something? <laughs> nice. Okay. And um, like there's a couple of things which I didn't realize. First of all, that I, ca I can't tell what like good score and bad score, like what, what the difference is. Right. Yeah. So it's I can't cool. tell if it's like horrible to read or not. Um, right. <laughs> it's just disgusting to read. Mm -hmm. But so, because uh, I used uh, layering, and you know, some of these melodies were augmented with me clicking in notes. Mm. I didn't even know they were playable. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Uh, basically, what this Nikos guy, Nikos Stavlos, mm -hmm. um, it's like super fucking good concert pianist. Um, he. Uh, 
I basically printed it out and then just gave it to him. And he sight read the whole thing. Uh, he sight read this, um, the Into one, which is in like seven, eight. Jeez. With the whole, the whole MIDI had a slight offset because <laughs> I, knew, I forgot to like put the first note to zero when I generated it. <laughs> and the bar length was wrong. <laughs> He managed to sight read the whole thing. Like, That's amazing. I mean, and it was so fucking impressive. <laughs> That's so crazy. And then occasionally he'd stop just to like with a pencil, just kind of like correct something or line in to show, to kind of remind himself where it, it like the bar starts, whatever. Uh -huh. But oh yeah, it's God. just super it's crazy watching him do it. That's incredible. And you got to be in the, so you just brought him in for a day session or something in the studio, yeah? Um, studio in, in a studio or at your house or at his house or what? What? Um, no, we went to a piano shop. Oh, right. Yeah, you told me this story. Yeah, that's fucking yeah. hilarious. Um, so, yeah, it's super fun actually. <laughs> like 10, and, 10 pianos in there, and we recorded a little bit on each one. How did you find this this piano player? He knew about it. No, um, no. I mean, how did you find out about him? Oh, um, it was a, a grinder hookup. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> I had a feeling that it was going to be that, but that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good for networking as well. Yeah, right? yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah, it didn't, didn't really work out. But, um, yeah, yeah, well, no, in some did. way it did. <laughs> it definitely did. Yeah, he's We're good. looking pianist and... Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't write that in the uh, album blurb. Yeah, I guess not. Eh? <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, so I have another question, which was, um, uh, it, someone from the chat asked if we could maybe see one of your uh, Ableton projects for the for one yeah. of the tracks from the song or from the album. Um, any which one or just, just any? Should we open it? Let's open it up to a poll. Who, okay, so which song do you want to see? Which song do you want to see the project file for? Everybody in the chat. There's a delay in the, the stream to the chat, so just give it a sec. Okay, we got one vote for Vacuum State. Um... And that's it so far. Let's see how many Should people I, are in this. We got one one vote for into. Hold on, just stand by. This usually takes a while. <laughs> Brock, hope uh, list, I'm gonna go list. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Come on, you guys, vote. Don't leave me high and dry. Okay, we, now we have one vote for three different songs. So Vacuum State, Into, and Emerging From. <sighs> Anybody else have a vote? Let's do this, y'all. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay, we got two votes for Into. Into is the reigning champ. Who else wants to vote? Vote, 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 a shiver sequence and wait a shiver sequence oh yeah so shiver sequence has the most votes yeah um so which was 13 
I just need to remember which fucking project it is. All right, I'll take your time. This is a slow-paced stream. Maximum chill. I'm gonna actually make this window a bit bigger, I think. Rob, are you still there? Oh, here we go. I can't hear you, Rob. Rob, I can't hear you, Rob. Turn on your mic, please. Turn on your yeah. mic. There we go. Okay. You're, um, also you're, um, I think that, might have been a different mic or something because your voice is super quiet now. Yeah. Oh, now uh, we go. No, no, no. We're all good. We're all good. We're back. Every good. Everything's good. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah perfect. Good? Delightful. Well, Can you move uh, Ableton uh, over just a oh, touch to the. L oh, no. I got it. Never mind. Got it. Got it. Let me figure out where these missing samples are. Okay. Ah, I haven't opened this in months. No. How does it feel? How does it feel? Uh, Are you going to get remixes for this album? Probably. Yeah. Um, I'm not looking to do that yet. So, I don't know. Why. <laughs> How much of this is going to be missing? Because I can't find these things right now. Uh, okay. Yeah, I know it's right. So we just beatbox the missing parts. Recording. Uh, right. So these are renders. So. <clears throat> so, I need to pick your permission. I mean, it's okay. We don't have, we, like we don't have to listen through all the way through. I just I'm curious about more about like just kind of hearing little snippets of individual tracks and stuff, and like if you wanted. It would be really cool to hear like what synths you're using for different things and like I don't know, just sound design shit basically. 
Yeah. So basically, this fact started because um, I saw the trailer of this movie called Snow Woman. Um, <laughs> you always have the weirdest stories for like where you got inspiration. Uh, I never actually watched the movie, but the um, the trailer it was like a Japanese movie, I think, mm-hmm. and it had this Japanese. Hello. Oh, you soloed a track. If you solo a track, your your voice cuts out. If you don't also solo the track that is the mic pass through. <clears throat> lel. Much lel. Uh, basically, start this time. Oh, did you actually sample the trailer? Oh, I guess we shouldn't say that. And, nah, nobody watches my fucking stream, anyways. Uh, <laughs> uh, it just had these really nice, kind of like. Yeah, that's wicked. Um, so then the next thing which came along was these hats, which I generated with the reconstructor. Re- sorry, just a quick question. Um, sometimes I, I re-upload the streams onto my youtube channel or like another youtube channel that has some stuff do you are you okay with me doing that for this one or would you prefer not to oh you are muted again Uh, (laughs) there must be a better way of doing this there is but it takes a long ass time to set up so are you okay with me resharing this yeah okay sweet okay sweet yeah so it'll be up on uh... so then next came along um, this hi-hat sound Oh, interesting. It's using this plugin which I made called um, Quanta. Mm -hmm. Tries to quantize in real time. Oh, nice. Yeah, I remember you talking about that a long time ago. I wasn't aware that you were still using it. That's really cool. Using the new time stretch stuff. In, in Max Seven, I think. Right. Um, yeah. So basically, the previous version, it would leave a little gap when it detected an onset, and then it would have to delay the audio from that onset to the next beat. Right. What it does now is it time stretches it. Oh, cool. Um, so it didn't work perfectly, but if you hear that, I, if I put on a. Uh, Can you hear it like kind of gets it? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a nice, nice blend because it's sort of like it's on, but then it's it slips off at certain times. It's really nice. Yeah, it's because I've got the division set to um, like uh, 1.5 notes. Oh, interesting. So I can put it on. Uh... Oh wait, no, I haven't. No, that's a lie. Okay. Uh, yeah, it just doesn't work perfectly, but um, but it sounds good. I use that quite a lot. Cool. Then don't forget to. There we go. <laughs> chords. Oh, we don't hear those. That's com chords. Where is it with this? Oh, did you ever end up making that thing where you can t- 
tune the the impulse responses in a convolution reverb to chords is that what you're doing i did um <clears throat> basically throughout this whole album i've used this plugin which i made called um oh yeah no i am i am using it here yeah Com content. and was that using the <clears throat> Oh, whatever i don't know that's too okay whatever i'm assuming that's complicated but i mean I'd, i'm cu i'm curious to hear more about that if if you feel like it <clears throat> yeah um so basically with constant uh, you drop a sample into this impulse response bit um and it makes 24 copies of that sound and pitches them up the semitone at a time mm -hmm. So you can um, so then you've got a bank of twenty four sounds which are all pitched up uh, like you could have pitched the album. That's nice. And then come the impulses um, to a set of twenty four convolution reverbs. And the why twenty four? To each. Oh right, twenty four because it's a pitch. Sorry, my bad. Okay, keep going, keep going. <laughs> um, I need to figure out this this delay thing because I can hear my voice in my head. Yeah, that, that delay, and it's so, so <laughs> it really sad. fucks you up, hey? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like destroying my mind. Yeah. Um, Do you want um, to? Um... <sighs> yeah, I didn't. Yeah. Okay, one sec. I'm gonna get a little bit more water. Um, do you want me to play some background music while you figure that out? Or is that going to be distracting? Uh, What's that? Because so what do I need to do? I need to somehow route the mic straight to the output without going through Ableton. Yeah, exactly. Can I just do like direct monitor or something? Uh, Wait, so you said background music is going to distract you or not? I just don't think I'll be able to figure it out very quickly. Oh, okay. Okay, one sec. I got to get some water anyways. Because I had the latency super low in Ableton. Right. But now that I've had to put it up. It's like got massive low. You could do, um, for example, like route your output from, so make a separate max patch, the route your output from Ableton into the max patch and your mic in to the max patch and then that goes to the to um, whereby so they're combining there instead I actually don't know uh, if that'll work I don't know if that actually helps to be honest I don't know you fuck have whatever two different sizes and two different software yeah I think so well I'll just open up some of the software Okay. Um, yeah, okay. I'll be right back. Entertain, entertain the people. <laughs> entertain. Um, well, this is going to be really entertaining as I have to pop some mic through.
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to struggle with this. Okay. Because the CPU load, the settings with this multi aggregate device, I keep getting these pauses in the audio. Ah, uh, right. <laughs> Like it's fine, and then it just kind of goes. Yeah. Like that, like that, like that, like that. Whoa. Cut, cut. Okay. Hear that? Yeah. Fuck it. Whatever. Um, <laughs> I can do another project that's got lower CPU usage. Sure. Yeah, that'd be sweet. Um. um <clears throat> someone was also asking about some like surround sound binaural device that you had in there. Yeah. Um. Oh yeah, do you still use do you use that dust thing that you made for um <laughs> I never used it. I <laughs> 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 like after spending a year programming it, I just didn't want to hear it ever again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No doubt. I I get that. I'm like I'm trying to be really careful like how much I listen to the AI music cuz I'm already like pretty fucking sick of it to be honest. <laughs> Um, but I was going to ask you also, um, um, Wait, shit. say that again. Oh yeah. Uh, no, I wasn't going to ask you anything. I, sorry. Uh, the binauralizer. Um, oh yeah. The binaur. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about that. So inform us, Rob. Basic. Teach us your ways. Where do I find that? Probably on there. Faster. Explain it faster, please. Faster? faster. Can you hurry up, please? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just. Uh, I saw it, didn't? Where? But can't, can't see it again. <clears throat> um, oh, it's definitely on the hats. Yeah, here we go. Nice. Um, so basically, it's a device um, like the actual convolution thing inside this is taken from um, a a device that I found on the internet mm -hmm. and basically I modified it so um, I need to be <clears throat> careful that I reference this uh, reference this original thing because um, this isn't entirely original um, I just added a bunch of stuff to it um, I added uh, yeah the UI um, which we didn't have, mm -hmm. um, and then this width thing Oops. as well here. Okay. So basically, normally with binaural, you've got a mono source, mm -hmm. which is hand around, which throws away a lot of the richness of the original stereo data. Mm -hmm. if it's a stereo sample. So I, I added this width thing that um, when it's not zero, it's just a mono signal, which is getting panned around. But if you turn the width up, it creates two sources oh. and, set, and puts one channel through each one. Nice. So if you have the width up like a bit and you put this kind of in the middle, then it sounds more or less like the original stereo sound. Uh -huh. You can pan it around as well. That's cool. So it just sounds a little bit more rich than uh, the standard binaural panning. That's nice. I had a... I can't remember. Oh, yeah. When I was doing stuff in the dome, I made like a thing for using this same like XY pad thing, but then having s several of the little knobs together and like just having them correlate in different ways, like using that, you know, the, the, the device I was showing you at the beginning where it has that graph of like the in out thing. Yeah. Uh, I just had a thing of relating one, one, um, it was sort of like that. It like relates one of the like the left side to the right side so you can take two channels and like move them around together around the dome but oh cool i didn't end up using a bunch of that but uh knowledge knowledge is asking how is the front and back generated filters question mark front and back oh right in the binauralizer yeah yeah so um Basically, uh, binaural panning works by having a set of 
something like 500 uh, impulse resp responses, which are recorded from actual ears. So um, basically, someone sits in a chair with microphones pushed really far into their ears. Actual then, ears? Uh, yeah, into their actual ears. Real ones? And then, yeah. Like not prosthetics? No. Oh. So it depends where you get your data from. Like oh, if you okay. get the impulses from, from, um, from like a, a dummy. Right. Um, but uh, I, I got this one from this data set where they've recorded like 50 different subjects. Uh -huh. I just, they've got this online test thing and I just picked the one which sounds the most 3D to me. Oh. But it's highly specific to your ear shape. So, right. so the actual binaural effect um, might not be as strong for like other listeners. Mm. Um, would you consider yeah, releasing so a separate version? Of, would you is, consider releasing a separate version of the album for people with different ears? Oh yeah, that could be cool. <laughs> you could do this like online checker thing to okay. find like I could do fifty versions of the album <laughs> for each of those different um, uh, That'd be sweet. setups. Yeah, that could be cool. <laughs> <laughs> like have tunes to your ears somehow. Yeah. Do you find that wait, so so say you run something through this binauralizer thing and I see that you have like effects after the binauralizer thing. Do you find that yeah. that does that do you find that that degrade degrades the realisticness of the binauralizer, or do you find that it's like it's not a bit of um, reverb definitely increases the effect before or after? My understanding after. was like after. Okay, okay. Yeah, because if you just do binaural panning with no um, reverb afterwards, it it sounds fake somehow because your your brain is so used to hearing like a little bit of reverb on sounds that it right. actually breaks. The immersion a little bit if you're com if it's completely flat and having just like a little bit of a like a small room reverb which i've done here mm -hmm. is um it just makes it sound much more 3d hmm. interesting it like gives your brain that extra little cue that you're in real in a real space especially if you're doing like a convolution reverb which is sampled from an actual space um it just adds to the kind of realism effect no oh, okay um yeah uh, uh try and open a project that's a bit less intense just because uh one that's a bit more sample based um oh, they're all pretty <clears throat> 11 this one is not very intense 10 this one. <clears throat> Do you still use Adobe Audition sometimes? Never. When did that drop out of your arsenal? Uh, years ago, really. Huh. I started because basically I got a little bit sick of the workflow. It's right. Like very, very um, kind of micro edity. Right. Um, and so I started trying to make this tool um, called Noise Canvas. Right, I remember this. Wait, so you it. never finished it? I thought you had a working version of this. Oh, I've got like three different semi-working versions. Ugh, can uh, you please? I really have wanted to try that Like for like as long as... I remember the first time you mentioned it to me, I was like, fuck, I want to try this so bad. I really want to try it as well, but like I can just never... So it started off as a... Um, like a Java thing. Well, dude, just fucking open source it. I'm sure there's tons of people dying to just like fuck around with this kind of stuff. Yeah, basically the spanner in the works was Ableton come along, coming along with Max for Live. Oh, right. Because I really, really wanted it to be super integrated into the workflow. I didn't want it to be a separate tool that I was kind of mm. exporting samples to and then bringing them back in. I wanted it to be in Ableton. Mm -hmm. But then I started writing the whole thing again as a Max for Live device. Mm -hmm. um, and I started looking at, because uh, I read this interview with um, John Hopkins. Yep. And he was using, I can't remember, like Logic or something like that. But it had this really, really nice thing, which Ableton doesn't have, unfortunately, where if you like copy a sample around in the, in, in the arrangement view, mm -hmm. and then you edit that original sample, 
the, like in Logic, it just automatically updates that sample wherever it is throughout the whole project. Mm -hmm. Whereas Ableton, it like, I think it loads it into memory first. Uh. You have to explicitly tell it that you've updated this sample before it will up update it across the whole project. You and that would be super cool for like iterating, right? Because right. you can like build up this like really complex um, like chopping and cutting between lots of different samples, and then you just change the underlying samples, and those changes get prop propagated throughout the whole project. Right. Uh, so I wanted something like that. Um, you can't. Kind of you can't prompt Ableton. Like, how do you tell Ableton to do that? Couldn't you set up some like auto hot key script or something to prompt it to do that? So the way you do it is by doing edit here. Yeah. Um, and then you would set your sample edit to be this. And I, in, in this Max for Live device, I set it to be like a dummy thing where it didn't actually edit it. But mm. when you um, come back, it thinks that it's been processed, so it updates it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like this noise canvas thing would have been super cool if I'd finished it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's actually um, <clears throat> um, uh, yeah. Do do you want to actually? Do, do, would you care to elaborate on what the idea was a little bit? Like I, I kind of blanked for a second and forgot that we were in front of an audience. Um, but probably there's a lot of people who don't know what it was. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, noise canvas was a way of like trying to paint paint with sound. Um, so it's basically an extension of my techniques that I used for editing audio back in when I was using uh, Adobe Audition, which would basically be I would make a track like almost to completion um, before like mastering and stuff like that, and then basically split it into different layers. I would have bass. Uh, drums, melody, and effect, as like stems. And then I would go through and then just with a load of manual painstaking work, I would select bits of the audio. And then using the Adobe Audition effects, I would like reverse bits, I would uh, change the volume, um, and basically do destructive edits on it. Because mm -hmm. um, the, the cool thing about destructive edits rather than sort of real time effects is you can fuck around with time. Mm -hmm. Like like the classic sort of backwards reverb effect. You yeah. just can't do that in real time because it needs to know the future. So like I, re I really like the idea of destructive edits and you can get like super crazy sound like sounds just by like repeatedly processing the same audio. Mm -hmm. But it's just so painstaking um, that I'm just, I don't know, I think I'm too old to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would just like go into these trances for like hours of just like editing like tiny little bits of audio and it would just take me hours to do just like 10 seconds and I just can't be bothered to do that anymore. Yeah, I feel um, you. I actually, I, I took kind of a big break from doing that. Like the last time album had very little of that. And then over the summer I started getting kind of more into it and now I find I'm like, I'm excited about it again. Those like that. I find there's something really special to me about that sort of trance state that you get into when you're doing the micro edits. And I, yeah. I, I just, there's like making music without getting into that. I feel like it just, um, it, it just doesn't feel the same to me. Like it's, it's almost like the track doesn't feel complete if I don't like get to that trance state at least once. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still have the trance state, but it's not necessarily with like micro edits so much anymore. Ah, right. Okay. It's like, I th it's not like I spend less time on the tracks. I still spend the same amount of time, but mm -hmm. I just spend it in different areas now. Yeah, yeah. And like I put a lot more time into um, like panning and and like oh, the textures and, and the actual composition and and the sort of overall kind of like flow, I guess. Because yeah. I feel like my older tracks were very sort of stream of consciousness. I would just sort of, I'd be into one thing and then I'd you know get really into that. And then I would get sick of it, or I'd like just couldn't be bothered to do any more edits. So, I, but I'd feel like the track was not completed. So I'd like add a whole new section mm -hmm. and uh, start doing the same on that until I got bored of that. Mm -hmm. And and I think uh, some people like appreciate that that kind of style of track. But it's like um, 
yeah, they don't. It doesn't feel. Sometimes it doesn't feel very coherent, like between the start and the end of the track. Um, so I've been gradually moving towards sort of br broader brush strokes, I guess. Mm -hmm. I still do like doing micro editing, and this is where the noise canvas thing will come back in if I eventually finish it. It was basically you start with this an empty buffer, and then you've got all of these uh, brushes. And the brushes are stuff like a sample brush, mm -hmm. or a reverb brush, or a, a time remapping brush. And then basically um, using a like a Wacom tablet, like a one that you'd use for digital painting, you brush you like paint into the waveform, mm -hmm. and on the stroke that you do. Say if you did like a um, like a sort of horizontal line going like up north northeast you can oh, yeah. horizontal uh, oh yeah like horizontally like north <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what i mean horizontally yep. north. yeah yeah horizontally <laughs> all right clearly yeah i mean other than yeah. you know usually i go horizontally south but i understand <laughs> um yeah so basically every time you paint into the into like the blocker, it overlays it over the previous thing and that could be a sample, but it could also be a, an effect. So mm -hmm. if you just do like five quick brush strokes, just like psh, 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 it would apply five reverbs in in that part that you've just done. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could map different brushes to um, keyboard buttons on your keyboard. And then you could hold down different combinations and it would apply those brushes at the same time. Oh, cool. Like so layered like, on top of each other, or like like in secret in series, like late um, in like in series based on order that you press it. So if you press like yeah, reverb cool. there and then filter, mm -hmm. it would apply in that order. <clears throat> and Interesting. You hook up um, the parameters of each effect to like the Y position. Yeah. But also the pen pressure. Okay. Uh, so like. It was like a very early draft phase, um, but it was already getting like really cool signs with just like a sign brush, like because oh, it had these um, brush modifiers mm -hmm. where you take your input stroke and it would say like multiply it a hundred times and scatter it out over time. So even just with a um, like a sign brush with the Y position mapped to the pitch. Um, you could just like brush around and you get these like super weird kind of um, additive synthesis styles sort of like cool. sort of things. And that was just with the sign. So I think it's got potential for like sound design. Um, yeah, for sure. Is somebody mentioned in the chat the Tim Exiles, the finger? Did you, when you saw that, did you think like, oh, that's kind of similar? Or were you like, oh, this is not at all what I was thinking? Um, so the finger is like he's all about live use, right? Um, so that like that's super geared towards like being able to mash around and jam live. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like ma the majority of my processes are all about like offline right. composition, which kind of changes the whole direction a little bit. It's not so much about um, you know generating something cool uh, like immediately that you can kind of jam around with. It's more like something you know where you're in for the long game and you can sort of right. spend time to kind of tweak it a bit more finely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Have you have you met Tim Exile by the way? Yeah, I have. Um, I played a show uh, with him like a bunch of years ago, and then he invited me for breakfast at his house the next morning, which oh, was super that's nice. nice. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, we just had like a really long chat about, um, I didn't know, but he used to, um, make, uh, stock music. No way. Yeah. And, um, he, one of, one of the ones which he did, um, was Britney Spears, uh, Poison. Shut like, up. He, re he really likes, um, like wait, pop music, like good po pop wait. music. Poison or Toxic? Toxic, that's toxic. the one. Yeah, yeah. Um, Wait, he made that fucking. No, yeah, he didn't dude. make the track. He um he did like a version of it basically. Oh, crazy! He, it was one of the hardest things that he's ever done. That's so funny. Um, yeah, like he's got a lot of respect for 
like well done pop music and he really likes that track yeah that, i love that track that's me and my friend ty always like that's both of us that's like our reference track a lot of the time if we're like checking new speakers or checking a new setup or something yeah. and we figured out that it was both of ours and we laughed about that okay <laughs> it was funny um it was really fun. yeah okay uh, <laughs> And oh yeah, and then I bumped into him again at Sona maybe two years ago, mm-hmm. just in the crowd. And uh, I walked up to him and was just like, "Hey!" And he was like, "Who are you?" <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Because I I started wearing contacts and I've got a beard now. All oh, right. Uh, he just didn't recognize me. <laughs> but yeah, then finally he did. He did, and uh, yeah, we had a good chat and went to see Sophie. Oh nice. And he, he hadn't heard Sophie before. Oh, that must have been an interesting yeah, moment. Fucking blew his mind. Yeah. Was, uh, such a good show. Oh, actually, speaking about that, speaking about Sophie, who are like, do you have some kind of favorite uh, new up and coming artists? Or like, are you, is there any artists that you're listening to now that you would highly recommend or any that you're like, oh, this person's cool, but it hasn't gained all that much traction yet or anything like that? Um. Or just in general, yeah. like, what are some cool artists that you like? To be honest, I'm only just getting back <clears throat> into music again. Oh, yeah, like, fair enough. Because um, when I'm in, like, a composition phase, I don't, I just don't listen to music because it, it either completely um, just shatters my confidence. Right. <laughs> or I find that I just copy it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I end up um, doing that a lot, too. And also just because I'm spending a lot of time just listening to music, like my own music, it's just, I don't know, I don't, I don't really listen to music when I'm, I'm writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm only just kind of getting back into it and I feel a little bit out of touch, to be honest. Um, I had to make a mix for um, Club Aria, this, this Japanese um, mag, uh, recently. And that was a struggle because I suddenly had like an hour to fill. Um, mm-hmm. And I didn't want it to just be, you know, stuff that like, I didn't want it just to be classics, you know, the whole time. Right. Um, I, I spent like a, a day just uh, researching some new stuff and I found some, some quite nice things from that. Um, but yeah, again, they're not like, they're sort of quite established artists already. Mm. The new uh, Telephone Tel Aviv, did you listen to that? No, but I went to go see him the other day actually. Um, like before the lockdown, obviously. Mm. Um, and I totally am a big fan and stuff, but I found it quite disappointing to be honest. <laughs> yeah. There's basically, there's this one track in that album, which is the, it's the first track uh, mm. in the new one. And I really, really, really like it. Um, it's just kind of got this like stuttering, um, you know, like that Aphex track. Uh, it's like dun 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 dun. It's got that, but um, just on this really like harsh kick drum. It's just like just with these kind of like epic chords and stuff like that. Yeah, it's just really nice. You should that that actually reminds me of this sunk. One of the guys from the chat has this track that's sort of like that, but it's like a lot more maximalist and like hardcore than the, I think I know the tele, telephone Tel Aviv track that you're thinking of. And, but, or sorry, maybe, no, sorry. But anyways, but this sunk, you should, I, I want to send you some of the stuff that people are sending for the uh, track too. review. Um, actually, yo, you should uh, uh, tune in on, if you're free on Saturday, I'm going to do another track review. And there's some, there's some, well, actually, the, a, a big majority of the people that send in tracks send fucking crazy good shit in. It's really cool. Um, but yeah, no, I'd be happy to send you some some of the kind of my faves from the last couple of weeks, if, if you want. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that sounds good. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm doing this, actually. Um, I haven't done this before. It's super fun, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of just like I mean, hanging out with, like, I, that's why I really like it. It's like It feels like just hanging out with this group of people and maybe like to you it feels more like you're just hanging out with me but like with the if you're like on the chat i just really like chatting to you basically greg that's, <laughs> that's nice i like that it's always, always entertaining always in, insightful <laughs> but the um what's it called but the chat is also really nice too like just 
it just feels like this nice like hanging out with all these fun people yeah i haven't um, really uh, dipped into the, the twitch thing yet yeah i know we've been talking a little bit behind your back <laughs> oh yeah oh shit There's loads of cats in <laughs> um but yeah it's been fun cool uh Uh, the one that i've got open at the moment is the um is the piano one mm -hmm. uh it's very low cpu usage so i can probably play this one for sure nice Um, The audio coming through is a little bit like... Um, Are you hearing that? I am hearing it, but it kind of sounds like it's coming through a speaker. Is it? But it is routed directly, yeah? You're not playing stuff off your speakers, are you? No. No, it should be going straight through. Okay, whatever. Just keep playing it. It's fine. But anyway... Um, Good enough. We know what it sounds like. <laughs> so uh, this basically came just from a mashup of the different recordings that I had. Um, Because in this piano shop, um, I basically paid this guy, the owner of the shop, to not have any customers Mm -hmm. for the afternoon, Um, which I don't think he had any customers anyway, because the the pianos were like 20 grand. (laughs) um, But I paid him and he didn't really, he didn't really get that um, I was kind of paying him for him to be a little bit quiet. Oh God. (laughs) Recording. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so uh, I did all of these recordings and he was like um, sort of fixing piano mechanisms and sort of generally like clattering around and stuff in the background because like I wanted this one to be just a, a pure like one take uh, recording mm-hmm. just because there's something satisfying about that. Yeah, no doubt. And finally when I actually sat down to edit them like well get them together I realized that there was you know, cars going by and and sort of yeah, him clattering around, dropping things. So I ended up having to edit together a bunch of different recordings. Um, but finally, that worked out in its favor, I think, because it it forced me to be a bit more creative about um, kind of like merging the recordings and stuff like that. So like this, the, it starts with the just the binaural mics, mm-hmm. which is like very background noisy and kind of quite like. Um, it sounds very 3D. Nice. And you can hear kind of all of the background noise. But then when it comes into the main kind of thing, I fade in the other recordings. So it suddenly kind of becomes much richer and like. Yeah, the recordings in general, like the piano recordings in general on this album are like, they're, they're, they sound fucking huge. It's so nice. Um, <clears throat> yeah. It's- phone that I've, I bought basically it wasn't even that expensive it's like 70 euros or something like that what this is the um, one that you're using for this now yeah um and it's uh it's mono um so basically i used the this mic to get like the richness of the frequencies and then to get the stereo field um i used binaural oh wow so then i overlaid the two mm-hmm. um yeah just because well, you can. This is the um, mic on its own. So it's like very bassy, very rich. Um, sounds really nice, but it's like the stereo field is not very wide. Um, um what's the? I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna post the mic in the chat. What's the um, what's it called? MXL seven seventy. Seven seventy. Um, not like not a particularly advanced mic or anything. No, no, but I mean, as that's actually why I think it's it's it might be a nice thing to post in the chat because um, <clears throat> it's like because you mentioned that it's cheap, but it sounds good. So I think that's like kind of primo shit no yeah isn't it wouldn't you yeah, agree it's, uh... well you can get it new for like well 
on Amazon is like $65, $100. I don't know why there's such a wide range of prices. Um, okay. But yeah, it's just nice, it's nice sounding. Like, I mean, I'm sure you can get way better mics, um, but for the price range, it was just perfect for what I needed. Sick. For. Yeah, cool. Um, and then later, I basically, um, we actually did two takes. Um, and yeah, because like uh, he kind of um, like fumbled some notes and stuff like that. So we did two takes, and in the second take, um, I I was basically walking around with the binaural mics in to get a bit of kind of bit more of the room sort of sound, uh -huh. and then I merged that in for like the the sort of climax of the track. Oh, so nice. so it's kind of like it goes even wider in, in this bit here. So there's the, the new ones coming in now. Yeah, so this is probably like the, the simplest one from the album. Nice. It's, it was still super fun to, to make it. Actually, the hardest part in this was actually composing the original piece. Um, I can imagine. Yeah. I used the... Uh, did you check out those um, Messian modes? I did, yeah. Uh, I, I, I watched some Rick Beato videos about them. They sounded really interesting. Um, I... But then I ended up getting kind of sidetracked by just like <clears throat> it kind of it, it kind of made me it, it, it like kind of opened this door in my mind a little bit because I was sort of it sort of made me realize that like like this whole idea of like staying in one key is is really limiting and and actually just using your ear and then like going to whatever the fuck note you feel sounds right is like is actually a much more interesting way of writing at least for me it's i find it's a lot more interesting way of writing music and you can make stuff that's a lot more interest intricate and complex without like thinking too much about like for sure if you set yourself up with something kind of more complicated like that like the messy and mode thing or if you think about like like moving from one mode to another or that sort of thing there's an interesting thing that comes out of that but like it just I ju yeah, I just found it really eye-opening for like um, messing around on my own of of just being like, oh yeah, fuck it, like it doesn't matter if the note is in the same key, like huh. that's totally fine for it to not be in the same key as long as it sounds good, yeah. then it's fine. But yeah, did, actually, do you want to explain the Messian mode thing for the people in the for the people at uh, home? Yeah, I don't. I like. I'm not a music theorist or anything, so I don't know specifically. But this. I think it was some composer or, or something which basically invented a bunch of um, intervals, like scales based on very um, pattern-based intervals. So one of his modes is actually the whole tone scale, mm -hmm. the one that's like really kind of like mystical, you know, the sort of like, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. the sort of Harry Potter kind of scale. Um, so like that's like the simplest one. But then this one, I really liked it because it was... Um, it's basically like a minor scale and then you shift up one semitone and then you continue this another minor scale but it's like I, yeah, I don't know enough about music theory to really explain it properly mm. um, no no I mean like I think don't worry about explaining it like the proper way but I, I'm like a lot more interested in like your understanding of it and like how you used it you know what I mean like because we can there's I think that's like people can always go on YouTube and fucking listen to someone else's explanation of it, but like your understanding of it and how you, what you thought it sounded like and what you thought it was useful for, I think is, is a lot more interesting. Basically um, for me, because I've got all of these ingrained 
um, patterns, these kind of like go-to notes and chords. Um, if I just let myself like jam, for example, um, I always end up with the kind of same chord sequences and things like that, um, just because it's so ingrained. I've just been like writing the same kind of style of melody for so long that I find it really difficult to break out of that. And then so basically forcing me to at least try and stick within this unusual scale. Um, it just basically forced me to break my patterns a little bit. But then the original iteration of this um, was way too messy and like uh, it didn't it didn't have that sort of emotional weight to it. Mm -hmm. so then what I did was just broke the scale. Hmm. So that's when my old kind of intuition, I let it come back in. We yeah. basically put in some of the more like traditional resolves and stuff like that, just so that it kind of like it kind of resonates with with you a little bit more. Yeah, I find that 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 approach like is is the most useful. Like you learn you're you take some weird concept that took me a long time to understand, actually, because like I remember when we were talking a long time ago, you were like, oh, yeah, for this song, I had this concept or whatever. And I was like, how the fuck did you make a whole song like sticking to that concept? And it wasn't until later that I understood like that you take it as far as it'll go and like as far as it's interesting and then you make the small adjustments to just make it sound good, you know? I yeah, feel like that's yeah. like a that was a huge eye opener for me. So I just wanted to say that so that other people oh, I feel like a good, <laughs> um, a good piece of music gets this balance right, doesn't it? It mm -hmm. kind of um because I think I think it's about expectation. I was having this um, discussion with my flatmate a couple of weeks ago. That um, I'm, it seems to be about expectation in that you want to play into people's expectations to a certain degree, so that they can kind of tie that experience into their existing experiences. Mm -hmm. Like they can they can see how it relates to things that they've already listened to before. Mm -hmm. But then you don't want to go too far, otherwise you're just showing them exactly what they've heard. So then you need to take that expectation and then break it to a certain degree to basically like show something that's a bit outside of like their kind of expectation or um, but that it, they can like still tie it back into their existing things. So like I've listened to a lot of um like very conceptual, like experimental kind of noise stuff. And like the concept itself is very cool. Like, I don't know, they're like streaming data from like supernovas or something like that. Mm -hmm. then they just like hook the data up to like a sine wave and it's just like, <laughs> and like the concept is super cool, but it just sounds shit. So like at some point, the aesthetic choices need to take control. So like, yeah, you, you have this like concept or whatever, but then as soon as it's the concept is limiting, like how good it can just sound aesthetically, then I think it's okay to break that concept. Um, and that's, um, I tried to go like a little bit more on the concept side with this album, um, but still like, yeah, like it, I, I broke it a lot. Like right. and the, there's tracks just which are barely related to the original concept at all. Because hmm. you know you 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 start like trying to do this thing in the concept and then you just like sound designing or just fuck around fucking around you stumble upon something which just sounds really cool. Yeah, <laughs> like, you throw that away just to keep the concept. You know. Yeah, yeah. That's that finding that balance. I think is really like key. And and also it's kind of like I think. Um, Sorry. If I, okay. Um, yeah, finding the, uh, like the sorry. <clears throat> I think that the finding that balance is like so crucial, and like there's different ways to find that balance in like different parts of the blend between the two things, like between going far concept or having a little bit of <clears throat> like blending to make it work, or going like very little concept and lots of blending. It's always mm -hmm. interesting to me. Like <laughs> there was this uh, there was this post on like the R space subreddit or whatever and um and uh somebody was like i mean it was like oh yeah they took this the 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 
data from this planet and and sonified it into in uh, and and like sonified the data from from this planet from like the composition of this planet or something and you can listen to it online and i wrote and i wrote a response saying like oh okay how did they do that i'm curious to see what the process was and somebody wrote back i think they took the data and used um music software to turn it into sound <laughs> and i was like really <laughs> fascinating <laughs> um but yeah it's it's funny like i think that a lot of people who don't make who aren't super familiar with like electronic music think that there is a way to just like take data and or I mean I think probably the same thing happens with data visualization too. Like if you're not super familiar with it, you think that there is like this, you know, super straight up unbiased way of presenting the data. But realistically, it's like you just figure out kind of like as close as you can get to unbiased or like or at, and well depending on the the reason for 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 representing the reason for representing the data then you can have like different things that show you it in different ways and stuff and then same thing with sound like you can take your heartbeat and use it to control a thing in your or whatever you can take any input and use it to control any anything in your music but the way that you implement that is is really important and i think like in my in that like interpolate show that I was doing at the beginning, remember I was talking to you about, or I was, I was mentioning that terminal, like Max for, for Live thing where it uh, it like asks the, like it, it checks like the CPU usage and RAM and stuff like that. And then yeah. you can map yeah. that to different things. I, that's where I always get lost with generative stuff. It's like, is like the more you constrain the mapping, the the better it tends to sound. But then after a certain point of constraining the mapping, it's like, is it is it really generative at all? Like it like the it's like the better you make it, the less generative it is, you know? Or like yeah. the more specific yeah. you make it. And so the thing that's like the conceptual problem that I always struggle with in in generative stuff. Do you do you find that that's like a thing that you think about or 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 are you like like what what are your thoughts on that? Um so I mean there's a bunch of generative stuff. It's a shame that I couldn't properly show um a shiver sequence um just because it was cutting the cpu too hard um but yeah there's a bunch of generative stuff in that and i i normally the way i've normally done it before is i'll use generative stuff to like i don't know like fuck around with some sort of patch which just generates audio and then i'll record like 10 or 20 minutes of that and then later i will just chop it up and edit it mm -hmm. So the generative aspect is just generating the sound, really. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the actual editing is completely deterministic. But then with this track, um, I really tried to kind of let go a little bit and, and give a bit more control to the generative stuff. Yeah. And just like... <laughs> Like yeah, because it, and it just means that it's it's different. Every time you play it through, it's different, mm -hmm. which um, kind of was a bit annoying for me because it goes against what I normally yeah do. Like I'm not normally very like very controlling over the whole process, whereas with with the shiver sequence, I had to just sort of kind of generate the sort of overall vibe, and then lots of the individual de like details are different. Um, and I tried to leave it like that until right at the end. You know, I didn't freeze tracks and stuff like that. I just, I left all of the stuff in until right at the very end. Mm -hmm. And I exported it 120 times. And how um, much, wait, how much like flexibility, like, <clears throat> I guess my question is like, what kind of things were being randomized? Like, like how, because uh, that's, that's one, one thing that I do quite often too. Like some of my, live sets will have like certain sections that that like different aspects of the music are are random every time but i'm curious about like how li yeah like what are you what kinds of things were you random like so what was the most like uh 
what what's the thing that you randomized that had the biggest effect on the track and then what are some of the things that you randomized that had like the smallest effect on how the track turned out so the overall structure was pre-composed um like when certain things were going to come in when the melody comes in that's the same every time and the melody itself um i i messed around a little bit with uh generating some of the melody like um uh, mm -hmm using the data but i don't know it just it lost some of the the kind of emotional clout yeah so the, uh, the actual melody itself is is pre um pre-composed as well but then the whole bass line is entirely generative oh I that's interesting yeah like the the bass line is just completely different every time um and the bass line is quite subtle in that track it's like it's kind of just sort of drifts in and out mm -hmm. um, and I'm not even really sure if you'd call it a bass line, just sort of like a low down kind of noise um, but yeah, that was entirely um, the hi-hats um, using this uh, uh, like quantizing thing mm -hmm. because the underlying audio would never be quite in sync um, it just it was just always different every time so like the hi-hats and stuff like that are all generative um there's uh all of the voices as well um the voices yeah. which come in. i didn't um I, I i couldn't decide when that happens so like yeah, the interesting. Album version, um it's got this really nice fill which i was just so surprised when it when it happened <laughs> And like, you know, I'd, I'd listened to like 20 versions of like these 120 exports that I did and they all started to blur together. <laughs> but this, it just did this one little thing just completely by um, chance. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is the one. <laughs> um, it's... Uh... <laughs> Never have thought to do that. <laughs> and it just popped up completely randomly, and I was like, "Yeah, this is this is the album diction." Nice. But then, um, like, loads of little interesting details in the other versions as well. And so, mm -hmm. eventually, I just needed to be like, just to settle on one. Yeah. But um, I told you that the other hundred versions um, are going to be given away. Did I tell you that? Yeah, I heard about that. Um, yeah, so I really like that idea. I've like, I've been thinking about that for a long time. Of like the, it's like and I'm sure I think you have, I'm sure you have as well. Of like making an album that like every time you listen to it, it's different, or like that there are like a hundred different versions of it, or or thousands or whatever. I, I've I really really love that idea, and I like find myself coming back to it a lot, but never. It's just such a, <laughs> it's just so different from the way that I write music that it's not something that I ever end up like wanting to do. <laughs> but yeah, yeah that's, that's cool that you did it. Let's track a little bit. That's why what? That's why I struggled uh, with this track a little bit. I can imagine, it yeah. It drives me a little bit insane. <laughs> like, can you imagine like listening to... <laughs> no, not at all. It's brutal. Versions before I chose this one. <laughs> Fuck. And this was like twenty at the end or something like that. Yeah. And I listened to twenty afterwards. Yeah. It's like fucking hell. <laughs> do, um. <laughs> so, <clears throat> do you know any other artists like off the top of your head, like other than because the the artists that I know 
there that yeah the, the artist that i know that does that or, or does autecker still do that is that autecker still way of doing it and are there any other artists that you're aware of that do that really well um i suspect lots of artists use it i mean like generative stuff with like random kind of sequencing and stuff like that is quite uh but isn't my understanding like, was that like a lot of Autekker stuff, like every aspect of it ha is is kind of built in this way. Yeah, um, I don't know enough about their their processes to really say properly, but I got the impression. Well, my sort of fantasy of Autekker is they make this sort of like super complicated patch, mm -hmm. and then they basically just press go. Yeah, yeah, and maybe that's running for like two hours or something like that and then they just like cut out bits mm -hmm. um that's what i that's what i want it to be but it might be much more edited than that you know like they right. um they kind of like freeze in the generative stuff like early on in the process right yeah my that's sort of my that was always my understanding of what they did too but it, it feels like the more i dived into that stuff the more i was kind of like hmm is it is it possible to do that well not is it possible i'm sure it is possible but like it just brings me back to that question of like how much of it is like what are the constraints on the generative thing you know what i mean hmm. that's, the, the, that's the thing that i always come back to is like is like it's such a cool idea but like yeah i don't know i but yeah i do it the same way as you like i do a lot of like generative like generative sound design stuff but but very little like compos generative composition yeah i don't know yeah i don't know yeah i mean i think it's it relates back to what we were talking about before that like generative stuff is um is good until it starts clashing with your aesthetic choices <laughs> yeah I, it's funny because that was always the promise of, of generative music is that like, it's like, oh, you could make stuff that you would never think of. And it's like, well, but why would you think that? Like, I, I have a, this vague feeling of like that, that if something like, I mean, that's kind of what we were talking about before with the expectations. It's like if something is too different from what you would make, then you probably wouldn't think it was good. And you probably yeah. and you wouldn't be like, oh, I should release this. You'd just be kind of like, well, this one didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> Bam. Yeah, yeah um, it's someone in the my, actually it's it's interesting. Sorry. Somebody like uh Sunk just wrote in the chat like mentioning act like so he said, uh I think most generative stuff is really pseudo generative where people make the assets and then use those to create structured music and then actual fully generative stuff just sounds like Ryoji Aikido or something. But that's, that's kind of exactly what I was talking about is it's like, it's like the, that, that thing with AI, it's like the better the AI is, the more like the, like once AI gets good enough, then it's not called AI anymore. <laughs> you know, like I do find like, uh, I don't know how many interviews you've done about this album yet, but like, do you find in general, like when you talk to people that there's that perception of like, uh, like, like once you explain the process, it, do you do you get the feedback ever that like oh so it's not really generative or or any sort of like weird gatekeeping type thing? Um, sorry, not to shit on you, Sunk. I I didn't mean to shit on you. That's a fair question <laughs> and a fair point. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go Rob. Um, I mean, I've done a maybe two interviews about this album, um, and the band camp one, the band camp one, he um. He asked me a lot about the generative stuff, but it wasn't really into so much detail. Like, um, mm. I think because I had to sort of really explain the whole sort of generative concept right. to him. So I think he was uh, um, like super um, up to date with that that whole thing. Mm. Um, but I mean, so one thing that I'm getting used to with this album is fucking PR chat so basically with this with this album they've got a, uh, the label got like a proper like PR person involved and stuff like that mm -hmm. and sometimes like even when I've been talking to you like I've had to write so much stuff about this fucking album 
that like sometimes I'm not sure. Sometimes I think that I'm just like copying something which I just like wrote about, <laughs> and like sometimes yeah. I'm not sure how much of of what I'm saying is what I really think, and how much of it is just coming from this big document. Like I wrote like a ten page document about this album afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I, find it, I find it like. Because I'm, I'm not not really good at um, being very sort of open with stuff like this. Uh, I tend to just sort of, you know, make music and then just sort of dish it out, and then the label handles all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But if they've been pushing me to be a bit more like, um, you know, sort of outward facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm finding the whole thing a little bit. Yeah, you know, like they they come up come at me and they, they're like oh yeah you have to post like at least three things a week on instagram right and, um like how do you how do you deal with that you seem to be much more better at being like an outward facing musician than me i'm i'm tr i'm trying it's it's hard for me to i've been trying to post more on instagram but then the last couple of weeks have been harder because like that's the thing is like the, the my thought process for doing it was like um <clears throat> trying to streamline it as much as possible so like i don't think about like okay now i have to make uh something for instagram i just try to like whenever i'm working on something i'll try to like take a screenshot of it or like if it's appropriate for the thing i just try to ask myself before i finish any particular task that i'm working on like is this appropriate to post on instagram and if so then i'll then i'll take a screenshot or a little or a little video of it and then post that on instagram um and that seems to be the only way that I've been able to make it work. Cause like sitting down to try to generate content for Instagram is like, first of all, a huge, huge pain in the ass. And second of all, I feel like it's, it feels like a fucking huge waste of time. Mm -hmm. So like, so yeah, I just try to think of it in that terms. Um, and I also try to not overthink it too much too. Like I often try to like just rush the, cause the more I think about it, the more I try to make it perfect so that it like presents really well and looks really good. But I think that's part of why I've, I've wanted that to be like, I want the DIY thing to be part of my aesthetic too, because like once I start getting into perfectionist mode, like I'm not going to fucking finish that thing that I was supposed to post on Instagram. It's going to, I'm just going to be fucking around with it for fucking years, you know? So I have to force myself to just be like, Hey, just, just throw it together as quickly as possible and put it up. Yeah. Uh, a weird thing happened with this release that um, I've never done this before and I felt quite strange about it, is I gave pretty much all of my logins to um, like Instagram, Facebook, uh, SoundCloud, Bandcamp. I basically gave everything to the label mm -hmm. and I write the text and and say what images are going to be up but then this guy just posts everything for me whoa it's kind of quite weird but it actually it actually works out really well because yeah. it means i don't need to focus on like because like some people are really good at making facebook stories this mm -hmm. is a skill which is like very modern of like yeah. um, you know like laying things out in the, in the right way and also like synchronizing stuff between different platforms. So like when, for example, like announcing the release and when the actual release came out and stuff, mm -hmm. I would like forget. You know, oh, I fucking like, fumble that shit every time. time. Yeah. And, that, and just completely forget. And but so this guy is basically just posting for me for now. That's <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. That a lazy, lazy way out. But. No, no, but I think that that's the right way, right? Like you're your your job is to be a good musician not to fucking do all this extra shit and as much as i think like as time change, changes we have to all fucking adapt and stuff but like if you have the opportunity to like you know outsource that to somebody else and i think that's really the right way to do it right because you yeah. you it's it's important to like i think always that it's important to balance like like small things that you can do for yourself it's good to be able to do them, but then like the more of that shit that you take on, the less time you have to do the things that you're really good at. So it's important yeah. to think about like, what do you actually want to be good at and how can you make it so that you can dedicate the maximum amount of time to that and like shit, like updating Instagram and stuff, like while it is crucial and like that's, I've been noticing that about your posts is that you've, especially in regards to this release, you seem to, 
if the posts have I've been noticing how super on point they are of like okay this is coming out okay the next day there's a new thing and the next day it's a new thing or like there's a repost of a previous thing and it's like it's a very very well done like this dude who's doing it for you is fucking awesome at it yeah um, there's, there's a calendar basically he puts, um all of the things the calendar he's like okay by by this date we need to have something new and hmm. then um i will like say like oh well yeah it could be this thing and then he'll be like okay that thing needs to be done by this date mm-hmm. and it'll be like video or uh, like like a screenshot of the um like project file or something like that how do you um so do you meet with him like once a week or once every two weeks or something or like how does that process go down or is it all through email uh, it's all it's all online because they're based in london no i mean like yeah. is it through email or is it through like a video chat or something uh, we have Skype calls, but it's mostly email. Oh, okay. Interesting. But, uh, this guy, um, he wants to be my manager. How do you feel about what that? What does manager even do? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'll quite think this out. They do a lot of things. Like, um, my manager used to, like, it, yeah, it depends on the, the person who's being your manager. And it depends on, not, not currently, no. Uh, mm-hmm. it depends on how that person likes to work and what they want to offer to you and stuff, but they can do all sorts of stuff from like, for example, uh, helping like a really, really hands-on manager will help you like think about your, your brand identity and like how to develop your audience and how to think about like, like what release should come next and, and what would be an interesting path to, to, to take on for different releases or, or shit like that and the visual mm-hmm. aesthetics and stuff like that. But then there's also managers that are really hands off, right? So then the things that the kind of things that they would do would be like, you know, making a little whenever you're going on tour, they would like organize it so you have a little booklet so you know where you're going and you have all the maps and stuff like that. Um you, they would also that like, that's kind of like a tour manager. And mm-hmm. then your other manager would like like I'm not sure if this is an agency job. That's the thing too is like you can have a manager who also takes on some agency things so yeah i booking the booking agent stuff uh, sorry i get the i understand what a booking agent does yeah um, so th- like the manager like can do some of that but okay but but yeah generally not all of that but then the other thing like managers can also like help you apply for grants or help you strategize for like how to respond to to like what kinds of things to say in a in an interview, what things to mention, what things to not mention, how to deal with different shit like that. Like um, basically managers just like a, a, a person that you pay to also think about your stuff. And they can also like answer emails for you and shit like that. My, mm. my manager used to be also kind of take on a lot of the jobs of an agent as well. So sort of like a, a manager agent combo. And he was also a promoter. So he would also like book me for shows sometimes himself. <laughs> Convenient. Yeah. So it's kind of like a nice big uh, group of things. He was, he was fucking great. Like, um, yeah, I'm kind of sad that, well, I'm happy for him because he ended up taking this job here in Montreal working for this big company that organizes these all these different series of of events and he's a lot more into the booking agent side of things so or uh, not sorry um the promoter side so he's he's like picking what artists are going to play and when and blah 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 so i'm happy for him but i'm sad that i i lost him as a manager <laughs> uh, so i go sometimes yeah. i don't know what to say to this guy i feel like i'm not age to have a manager otherwise i would really do you wait do you have do you have an agent so i think that makes a lot more sense yeah no an agent would be much more useful to me um do you know um like jeff from meth lab yeah so you know he started this new thing yuku yeah i'm i'm on it (laughs) so he um he we had a chat the other day and he wants me to like do do stuff with them nice I said I was thinking about that, and then, um, <clears throat> and then this guy who wants to be my manager is um, going to try and set me back up with Little Big. Oh, nice! Because um, that was fucking amazing. Yeah, um, that's the kind of show which, like, 
was not connect with that. It was like incredible. But I thought you said that you weren't getting as many shows with with when you were with Little Big. Yeah, but I don't want loads of shows. This is uh, you just want good shows, right? One really good show a month, then I would be completely satisfied. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like fair enough. It. Like, cause those with with them, like I, um, I played like a big festival in Barcelona. Um, supported Venetian Snares, supported John Hopkins, supported uh, Square Pusher. Yeah, that's kind of like the best places for you to be, I suppose. Yeah, it was just like absolutely fucking perfect. Yeah, um, and, and the guy that was representing me left the company to, to go to Red Bull Academy. Ah, fuck. Um, yeah. And well, I mean, fun. that's like the other thing that, <clears throat> like, I think you just have to be careful in the way that the contract with this manager guy would be set up. But like, you can figure that all out through like talking with him and negotiating and stuff. But if you, if he is able to get you onto Little Big, then I think that that would be, in a lot of ways, really worth it. But yeah. But then you're in a situation where uh, Little Big is taking a percentage of your gig money and so is this manager, right? So I think that in a lot of situations, it makes sense to kind of have either one. And I would tend to think that uh, agent is more helpful, uh, especially if you're not super far along in your career. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is, is I'm not looking to earn like much money from this. Like the reason why I do shows and tours and stuff like that is because they were fun. Yeah, no doubt. I, I know I've I gave up like a long time ago trying to turn like music into my main career because huh. I felt like it was gonna I felt like it was gonna force me into doing stuff which I wasn't really super into. Yeah, um, and then that like takes some of the thrill out. Of, I'm not I'm not saying that's definitely what would happen, but. Because I really enjoy doing the programming stuff as well. Um, yeah. I make most of my money with the programming, to be honest. And and it's not like it's a side job to pay for the the music. It's, it's I actually really enjoy doing that as well. Yeah, that's cool. It's not like I'm... You know, it's, I, I, I wouldn't be too bothered about giving away money to these people. I would just want to be able to get like, nice shows and stuff, you know? Yeah, so then in that case, like... But yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. In that case, then it sounds like you know what you got to do. Well, though, I would be really stoked if you were on Yuku, on that roster, because then we would have a higher chance of getting to play shows together. But I understand that that's not really like your end goal is to like play back to back shows with me. But <laughs> oh, we totally should though. Yeah, we should play more back to back shows. I really, really enjoyed. Uh, got a lot of fond memories from that states gig. Oh yeah, that was so fun. <laughs> ah, good Did times. you read it about that show? Did you have you read about it? Yeah, I read a little bit because you mentioned that some something about it being on Reddit, and I yeah I, I read a bunch of there was so many funny concepts of or uh, like so many funny uh, comments of like of like that wasn't even music or like I like a little bit more music in my music instead of just fucking noise like people just being so mad about like they just couldn't understand it. <laughs> fucking hilarious apparently during my set there was a really, there was a queue of people trying to leave the uh the, Fuck. the dance floor <laughs> yeah it, it it cracks me up too because like like obviously not to shit on anybody that was there like i think that was a super that was probably one of my favorite shows that i've ever played like it was super yeah, yeah. super fun and like just a crazy venue to play in and like definitely like these these people who are really eager to hear something something new um, but like, but yeah, there was a lot of funny things of like, like, cause I remember coming up to the show as I was like, I was like, okay, cool. Like I want to do some experimental stuff, but I really want to make it a lot more dance floor friendly. And like, I'm, I'm not going to get too weird with it. And, and actually with my set, I felt like, I felt like I had compromised a little bit too much and went a little bit too far to the dance floor side. But now I'm really glad that I did because there's so many people who were just like, that was so crazy and so experimental and so out there. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's nowhere near as experimental as I usually play. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think um, after that show, I realized that I need to think a lot more about who I'm actually playing to because it was fucking bicycle day. 
Like, I, I didn't really clock this, but it's bicycle day, so everyone's going to be taking acid. And I ended my set on a really dark, aggressive note. Mm -hmm. Which is like, so people... I so did the I same did thing. I fucking thought... Oh, sorry, sorry, go, go. Play, like, start and the end, mostly. Mm -hmm. Like when, when you're playing a show, like, it's really important to get the start and the end right, because... Like, you can basically, if you've got a good start, a good end, and it's just shit in the middle, people still think that it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just ended on this really dark, brutal note. And I was reading in on Reddit that, like, it gave people bad trips. Yeah. <laughs> not, like, that's not something to, to joke about, really, because that can be really, really fucking nasty. That's true, I yeah. Think if I just, like, ended on, like, a much more, like, positive sort of kind of hopeful note then i mm -hmm. think that would have made it like much more of a positive experience for people whereas i just wanted to go like super brutal because it's just because it's fun yeah exactly yeah i did i did a dj set i did my first dj set recently, recently. Oh, nice. yeah. well yeah, yeah i was yeah. i was gonna say that like i think if, for me there's some types of like not bad trips but there's some types of like much darker trips that to me are can be a lot more enjoyable than some super super positive uplifting ones like the, I, the positive uplifting trips are super amazing and i and i love them for sure but but the uh but but like the really dark things can be super super fun as well i remember i don't know if i should be talking about this but whatever the i remember a long time ago i i took 2ci at um at shambhala and I had oh, yeah. the darkest fucking trip, like the most fucked up, dark ass trip. And then at the end of it, I went mm. to, to the, they had a little movie theater and I went to the, like an outdoor movie theater and I went there and I got a big bag of popcorn and I sat down and it was a, it was a documentary that was comparing the noise scene in the underground noise scene in Japan to like ritual animal slaughtering in Africa and it was oh. so fucked up. And they were just like strobing the images going back and forth. And I remember thinking like, this is probably having a really fucked up effect on my brain. <laughs> and like, it's probably going to scar me in some ways. But it was so satisfying. Like, <laughs> I was just like really enjoying myself. And so I think like, and, and in, in a lot of cases too, I find like the, the cathartic experience of hearing something really dark and fucked up, especially at a big music festival mm -hmm. it can make me feel really like uplifted and really positive because it's like this thing that I'm always searching for. And then to be satisfied with that uh, is like this different type of satisfaction and upliftingness that I think is really sad. So that, that's kind of why I went into that, that realm during my set. And I always try to do that. Whenever I play at a festival is like, I always try to have these like, I mean, that's a big chunk of my sound, right? Is like trying to have these really dark and fucked up. It's kind of almost scary moments, which I think is a bit cheesy, but whatever. Um, I like it. <laughs> I used to listen to metal, whatever. <laughs> and so it kind of like goes into that realm. But like, I, I mean, I see what you mean. Like it's important to, to be safe and like to not give people a bad trip. But at the same time, I think it's, uh, what qualifies as a bad trip. And also I think to a certain extent, it's like, it's important to be responsible of your own, like for sure, I want to make sure that people are safe, but I think that it's like, depending on how you break down where the responsibility lies for, for different people. Yeah. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, you know, play nasty sounds in it, in it. That, that's not what I'm saying. Like, I think it's, I think it's uh, nice to have like a range of emotions, right? It's like a lot of kind of dance music tends to be sort of, well, I guess I'm really talking about um, uh, kind of like nice techno sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it it can kind of, you know, it's very like euphoric and very uplifting and stuff like that. But it's, it's almost kind of like, I'm not saying monotone, but like mono emotion. Right. Whereas I think it's nice to have like parts in set where there's kind of like, you know, it like, yeah, as you said, it can be like scary or like sound really like angry or like really delicate or mm -hmm. I think there's like a wide range of emotions that you can kind of propel in a, in a set. But that day in particular, I, right, I just true. really should have ended on a positive note, I think. 
Yeah, I suppose you're right. And I think like there's there's definitely something to be said for like going to a fucked up place and then ending on a positive note. Yeah. It's a different yeah. experience than ending on a fucked up note. Yeah. Cuz uh I I told you about the the squeal of the banshee. Did you hear that? <laughs> no, what's that? <laughs> So um, I've got this like spectral freeze effect. Uh-huh. And, um, I've got this like button masher kind of thing that's kind of a bit like the finger. Mm-hmm. And uh, whenever I press a Z on my keyboard, it does this spectral freeze. But for some reason, like after about 45 minutes, sometimes that's like the kind of medium duration. Sometimes it never happens and sometimes it happens earlier. Mm-hmm. But when I press that key, it just puts out like a sort of, 15 kilohertz just kind of like (laughs) (laughs) that's amazing and uh and i didn't know this was going to happen and i was looping (laughs) so i did that and it ended up in the loop oh my god (laughs) and i didn't want to just like kind of admit it was a mistake so i kind of like tried to leave it in there for a while and slowly it out but it meant that the snare had been replaced with this like <laughs> and it just destroyed people's ears. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, that's what, um, I read some comments by that and, uh, and read it. <laughs> yeah, there is a. I tend to apologize actually. Because, uh... Oh, nice. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Um, yeah, that's an interesting. Oh yeah, I was. I wanted to ask you. I. I mean, I know. I remember we talked about this a little bit when we were on tour. But um, just for the for the folks at home, wh- how do you like? What's generally like? How much of your set do you like structure and lay out? And how much of it is left up to, um, how, or how much of it is left up to like in the moment? And like, what types of things are are in the moment decisions? And what types of things are are. Uh, what types of things are uh, structured? So basically, the the structure and the track order uh, is pre-planned, mm-hmm. um, based on what um, you know, what I feel like the type of night is going to be, or uh, um, the kind of if I want to show off some new material, or I've got this an idea of how I want to end or how I want to start. Like that's 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 pre-planned, and then. Basically, I've got a suite of um, effects, which are all beat synced. Um, so it's, it's kind of like the finger, I guess. Um, it's like a customized uh, version of the finger. So I've got this um, computer keyboard where I've taken out the keys which stop the music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and then I just left in, in like a typing position, um, like 24 keys. So if you imagine if you're typing and you've got like the F key and the J key, mm-hmm. those are where the index fingers lie. And then around that, um, on my left hand, um, I've got 12 effects, which I can press down and it will momentarily put that effect on. But I can press down multiple keys and it will do it will apply them in the order that I've put them down. So if oh, I've cool. got a spectral freeze and like a convolution reverb. If I do the spectral freeze first, it will apply the convolution reverb on top of that. And then the, the right hand is um, presets. Ah, uh, okay. So basically, I like, I'll like i hold down a combination of effects and then jump between presets um, of each of those effects. And then like that way, I, that way I can get sort of like nice heat sync, um, quite complex sort of glitch effects and stuff like that. No, oh, okay. I'm using that a lot, and then I've got this looper where I can loop, um, like, say, 16 bars or 8 bars, um, and it's an iterative looper. So if I do the, the key matching on top of that, then that effect, those effects stay in the loop. Oh, cool. And then that's on a separate channel, so then, like, for example, I'll use that for transitions. Mm-hmm. Uh, or I also use it to like over overlay stuff over a, like a track. And is that the, the live looper? Is that something that you made as well? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, and then I've got like a drum machine, um, which 
I just, I, I don't even use the front of it. I just, I took the back off to expose the circuits. And then, um, because it's a synthesis drum machine, it's not a sampler. Um, you can just basically mash your fingers on the exposed circuits and you just create little connections and it makes these like horrible kind of like <laughs> sort of like really, really nasty scree screeching sounds. Um, so I use that. Uh, sometimes I use a radio as well. <laughs> I remember that from that show that I went to see you like a bajillion years ago in London. Or you were playing with the radio thing. Oh, yeah. I remember that scene so well of like I was standing with your, your brother and your cousin or something. And you had just started and then it was with the radio stuff. And I was like, this is going to be such a memorable experience. <laughs> And then it got yeah. super weird, and I went home with those random people. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember. That, was, that was the first time we met, wasn't it? Yeah. That night. Not, that, not that night, I don't think, because we met... Um, we met... Um, I was staying at your place. Yeah. But, but I think, I think we, we met, like, just, the day before or something. One night or something. Yeah, I think I came the night before or something. Okay. But I, I mean, you know what? I don't remember. I don't know why I'm trying to, like be right um but yo um i uh, i think there's a lot there's a i think there's gonna a lot of people in the chat with questions so i think um i'm gonna go to the bathroom again and you, do you want to um just switch over to the chat and and uh and i'll yeah and everybody just ask your questions now and rob will write back to them and i will be back shortly yeah okay um, yeah, I'm just gonna get my cat out because uh, yeah, yeah. he's I'm trying to attack. Me. Okay. Yeah.
Hello? Ow! Fuck! Oh, my knee. Oh. <laughs> Wait, why were you muted? Typing. Typing sounds. Oh, typing uh, sounds are great. Great. I feel I feel like it'd be quicker just for me to to speak. Back and back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's generally how I do it. Si hablo español, tenemos españoles aquí. Porque España. Um, I wanted to I wanted to just have a change, I guess. Um, I felt a bit like I was stagnating in um in the UK. Um, I wanted to learn a new language. Um. Yeah, like Barcelona was it wasn't even, well, it wasn't my first choice actually. I was thinking about going to South America, or, um, but then I just found this master's course here, which um, looked really really cool, called Sound and Music Computing, um, and that this is where I learn a lot of the techniques uh, that I now use when I'm like writing the, the software. Um, it was basically like a mixture between um, computer science and music. So it was um, a bit about uh, music analysis, like how you can kind of try and detect emotion algorithmically in music, um, about uh, music interaction design as well, like how you can sort of generate, um, how you can make expressive instruments um, and what sort of expressiveness means uh, in like an instrument. Um, yeah. So um, that's kind of why I went to Barcelona. Also, it's fucking hot here, and um, it's full of beautiful people. So, <laughs> and it's got beaches. Um, no, I'm not German. I'm Welsh, um, from a town in South Africa. Um, what kind of software am I writing? Um, so yeah, I do like um, music software as well, but. On the side, I do a bunch of different software. I've got a bunch of different software projects. Um, I'm writing some games. Um, I'm writing an app to kind of help you keep track of just um, stuff that you want to watch or listen to or play. Or um, also for cash, I do um, like apps like shitty kind of boring apps and stuff like that um but it pays well and it allows me to do what i love doing so um, early inspirations um so i mean it's a little bit embarrassing but maybe my first early inspiration was fucking lincoln park actually um, <laughs> Believe it or not, because uh, there was this one track on on the album um, that was like kind of scratching, but it's quite heavily edited. And uh, yeah, it actually, <laughs> if you listen to that track and you listen to maybe some of my earlier stuff, you might see some sort of <laughs> resemblances. Um, but yeah, basically, I had this kind of, well, I still do have this encyclopedic um, music friend. We basically just listened to everything and when we were 16 we used to go around to his house and smoke spliffs and he would basically just play me like apex twin and and and, and people like that and then he lent me drux uh the album uh, and i listened to that and it just completely blew my mind because before that i was like listening to kind of like uh emo and um yeah like and then before that, like Linkin Park and stuff like that. So I just didn't really, and I thought I associated electronic music with like, I'm blue, ba -ba -dee, ba -da -doo, ba -da. that's what I thought electronic music was. And then he showed me drugs and it just completely destroyed my brain. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Uh, what games am I playing? Um, so, uh, because of this whole fucking lockdown shit, um, I just started playing this like epic RPG with a friend called uh, Divinity Original Sin 2. Um, and it's like absolute time sink. Um, I'm really enjoying it though. But um, yeah, I probably, I probably wouldn't be doing that much if uh, if I could actually 
leave my flat. <laughs> um, I tend to go for like smaller indie games. I'm 32. Um, how much time do I spend on the average track? Uh, it completely depends. Um, I remember in FL Studio, it had this feature that you can, um, it actually told you how many hours that you'd sunk into a track. And it was kind of quite terrifying sometimes to look at that. But in Ableton, it doesn't like track sort of stats like that. So it's hard to say because I, I don't know, this album was kind of, uh, I did like six months on it, um, probably more or less like half time to full time, um, maybe like 20 to 30 hours a week. And then I ran out of money, so I had to make um, some like apps and stuff like that for a while. And then I did this music retreat, um, which was a month on my own, uh, like micro dosing and smoking loads of weed in this um, super remote town in uh, northern Spain. Um, and yeah, I spent a month there on my own. And that's where I made most of the progress of the album, to be honest. Um, like, it was just completely. I, I just, it's not that I had nothing else to do, but because, you know, I could go outside into this like beautiful uh, countryside and, you know, I went on long walks and stuff like that. But because I went there with this mission, I was just super focused all of the time. Um, and it was just very, very inspiring. And yeah. Spiritual alien feeling to the music. Um, so, I mean, I'm a huge, like, sci-fi fan, um, really, really, you know, read a lot of Ian Banks and Alistair Reynolds, and so, like, and I come from a science background, so there's, there's definitely this spaciness in my music, which, um, which is quite consistent, um, so I can, I, I think, like, the aspect might come from that, um, but it's not like I try and make it sound alien. It's just, I don't know, that's just gradually over time my cause aesthetic choices generally sort of tend towards that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, no worries. It's quite fun, actually, I have to say. Maybe I'll do this more. <laughs> yeah, you should. You definitely should. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Do you, do you want to keep answering uh, questions? Or how are you feeling? Uh, so I might I might need to go and eat some actual food soon. Yeah, that's probably uh, a good idea. That, how long have we been doing this? Like three hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, yeah, three and a half hours. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll stick around for another five, five ten minutes or so. Though, I think. Nice. Um, favorite albums of all time? Um, I always go back to uh, All Is Silence uh, by Amit Sub. Have you listened to that, Greg? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Remember we listened to it to I mean, I have listened to it, but do you remember we listened to it together in, uh, in New York? Um, where? Why did we listen to it? You know what? Fuck you. How about that? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I still think that's really fucking good. Um, I'm not. I don't want to say it's my favorite album of all time, but um, I listened to that. When did it come out? Like 2013 or something like that. And I still, still really, really appreciate it. I just think that it's got this very like. I find it very satisfying when someone finds a vibe, and then continues to nail that vibe for like a whole album. Like it's very consistent. Mm. It shows that it's not not just something that they've stumbled upon by chance it's like they really they really know the vibe that they're going for and then they can just stick it throughout the whole the whole album I've yeah i lot fucking of love that um another one which does that for me is is death center owl flinters death uh, center what death center what um wait is that the artist name or the is that That's another amit sub no, no, it's it's uh, it's Al Splinters um, is the album, and the artist it's um, two guys. One does um, uh, strings, and the other does kind of more piano-y stuff like that. And then they mix it with 
like electronic elements. Um, okay. And then the album's called Owl Splinters. And this is one of these albums which is just nailed this like one specific like vibes right the whole thing mm. just like so icy like it's like it's <laughs> like all of the sound design is so like crisp and it, it makes me think of like really cold winter days mm. um and i just like absolutely love it um <laughs> and they did this really cool this really cool stuff with um and probably someone knows more about like music theory and stuff would just be like oh yeah that's you know doing the shift on the third of the fourth or whatever but, um, I think there are just, some music theory nerds in here, so that, yeah, maybe it'll be interesting if one of them chimes in. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, they do this thing where they they merge between kind of major and minor in this in this way that like they have two scales playing at the same time, and it's kind of like some it's like somehow major, but then somehow minor. Like, cool. I don't know. It's just yeah, it's a really unique. Kind of bound and um, I've copied it quite a lot to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Sorry, sorry. Inspired, inspired <laughs> by. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, any film recommendations? Um, <laughs> um, what have I watched recently? Um, oh, I watched um, Symbol. Uh, it's this Japanese film, uh, which is fucking bonkers. Uh, Greg, you need to watch this movie. Okay. Um, it's called <laughs> Sim. Um, and it's basically this guy it's between two storylines that just seem completely different, but then they wait, weave together in just the weirdest fucking way. Cool. And one of the stories is about this guy w- w- waking up in this white box and. Um, these uh this sounds completely stupid but these like cherubs kind of like emerge from the walls and then <laughs> when the mood, they, they sort of dissolve back into the wall just leaving their dick <laughs> poking out of the white wall Amazing. but then their, their dick is a button and if you if you press one of the cherubs dicks like this slot opens in the wall and an object flies out and every time you press that same dick, the same object flies out, and it might be like um, like a bell or some like food or something like that. And basically, he's just trying to figure out how to get out of this room. And then the parallel story is about some uh, Mexican wrestlers. Uh, uh-huh. It's about this Mexican wrestler, obviously in Mexico, and um, he's got a heart condition, and um, it's about his family trying to convince him not to do the final fight, and they different stories but then they just merge together in this fucking super unusual but quite funny way amazing well done that's super Uh, cool (laughs) fuck that's cool (laughs) yeah you should uh check that um i've also been really enjoying the uh watchmen series actually um i thought after the film which was a bit of a bit of a disappointment the uh the series is, is fucking super good huh. did you watch um did, i've been watching uh <laughs> i've been watching altered carbon recently and it's super it's fucking cheesy but it's, i've actually found it really enjoyable like the the universe is quite interesting like it's um it's like uh sorry i keep fucking losing my train of thought <laughs> after i like stream for a little bit i just my brain just starts shutting off randomly anyways but yeah the the series is about this alternate universe where you um like your consciousness is stored in this little chip uh that they put in your neck and you can be in they can transfer you from different bodies and they call bodies sleeves so you can move from you can have your your brain in one sleeve and then they can take it out and put it in a different sleeve. And then the sleeves also have like different augmentations and stuff. So you have like a better fighting, like a military sleeve has like these fighting things. I don't, it's really fun. Like the show is pretty fucking stupid, but, but it it, like, there's a lot of really fun stuff in it. I've been really enjoying that. Cause yeah, I saw the first season. I haven't seen the second season yet. Yeah. It's Um, like, I mean, I've heard, Wait, what? You liked it or no? 
I liked the first season, yeah. Mm. It, it kind of lost its way towards the end, I thought. Um, yeah. It, it kind of had this whole storyline with these, like... It was like a backstory of one of the characters I can't really remember. Yeah. Because what I really liked was the city that they lived in, like this kind of cyberpunk um, yeah. thing where like all of the rich people lived above the clouds and everything <laughs> and lovely and then everyone else just lived in this kind of pit hole below. Yeah, there's this there's vibe. this funny um there's this funny like like almost a little bit too on the nose thing about the people living in the cloud, <laughs> like the rich people living in the clouds to so the people living down below. But I, I also, I really liked that aspect too. And it was mm-hmm. a cool idea, but yeah, that's what I mean by that. That show is like a little, like it's pretty cheesy, but it like, it's also pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. The wire is a fucking classic. Um, I haven't seen it in, in quite a long time, but, yeah, it took me like a few episodes to get into it because I just had fucking no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> but um, yeah, like after like a couple of episodes, you start to get like into the into like the kind of vibe and stuff like that. And yeah, it's super fucking gripping. <laughs> really, really love that show. Yeah. Wicked. 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 <laughs> All right, cool. So that feels good for that. Yeah. Um, Let's call it, let's call it a day. I'm getting pretty yeah. douched. I'm gonna call it a day and eat some food nice. and eat a cookie and smoke a split and watch some fucking thing on the TV. Nice. I'm gonna take a little break too because I'm super pushed. But then I think I'm gonna come back and do my normal production stream for a little bit if I can get my brain in the right place. Um, so. Thanks so much, Rob. I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. It's nice to chat to you. It's been it's been a long time since we're our last chat. Um, yeah, and I hope to speak yeah, to you I, soon. I genuinely, genuinely really enjoyed this. I don't get much of an opportunity to um, like show the sort of more techy side of the stuff that I do, um, <laughs> and it's um, yeah. I I'd like to go into more detail about some of the stuff at some other point in the future. Um, I, yeah, I'd love yeah. that. That's honestly um one of the things that I was also kind of thinking is like, um, it would be fun to have a chat one day where we sort of, n- uh, like specifically on stream. I mean, we can do this in in general, but like it might be fun to have a chat where we, um, like, just have a little brainstorm and then try to implement different ideas and see how like our different approaches come at it and and like, I don't know. I think that could be a super fun. Thing yeah to do yeah um i'm not like super in music mode at the moment to be honest um, yeah it could be like a programming that, thing yeah I'd, I'd probably be more into like patching or something now mm-hmm. um i made a device yesterday for doing um so um i, I probably shouldn't talk about this um hmm. but anyway there's it. this project with um max that might be coming up um and uh he wanted like a shepherd tone generator thing nice made this patch where you can like um drag in like any sample instead of just doing it with uh sign tone oh, nice. put, like, like 32 layers and stuff like that and change this distance <laughs> and it's really cool if you put the distance not to like the octave which is like the classic but just like a couple of cents like a, a part mm. you get this, like, super weird like phasing stuff like as they as they kind of like all Ooh. It's, it's cool actually cool um, I, I think uh, like these days I'd be more into like doing that kind of stuff rather than trying to make a track or something. Yeah. Sweet. I'm actually kind of a little bit more in that mode. I'm like, I've kind of all the production stuff I've been doing lately is well, like I'm doing some music for this short film, but like in general, I've been doing so much more like, uh, just making fucking dubstep to be honest. (laughs) Um, what's that? Sometimes you just got to do it. Yeah, no doubt. So, yeah, so I haven't been in, like, an IDM production mood lately at all, but it'd be super fun to do some patching with you. Yeah. Okie dokie. I want to do, like, a, right. a techno banger. What's that? I want to do, like, a really brutal techno banger. Like, yeah. It's, like... Should it's we call almost that? almost apart, <laughs> but then somehow it feels somewhat pulled together because it's got, like, a banging kick on it. Should we Should uh, we do it together? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd love that. Um, Maybe with this uh, shepherd tone thing in. Yeah, wicked. I put that in. (laughs) 
you can shepherd tone kicks as well. What? Like, because if you, um, like, the layers can be synchronized. Oh, right. So you have a kick where, like, every time the kick hits, it's like, like it's slightly pitched up. Like, the, you know, higher kicks are coming in from the top. Oh, like for each individual kick? Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant, like, the kicks in general are, like, constantly pitching up. Like, it's like, do, 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 But, like, <laughs> in a shepherd tone way. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of stuff to play with. Sweet. But, um, yeah, I'm going to go. But, okay. um, yeah, thanks to all of you people that have been listening. And um, Yeah, thanks so much yeah. for everybody who showed up. Yeah, there's some uh, insightful questions. And... Um, I'm glad I got an opportunity to to show some of the stuff to you. Sweet. Uh, yeah. I hope to catch you around soon. Cool. Uh, all cool, right. Greg's. Um, yeah. Have a nice evening, morning. You too. Um, and uh, yeah, speak soon. Speak soon. Catch you later.